Good evening, I'm Marianne Edwards, Mayor of Temecula, and I am here to call this city council meeting to order. So let me get on the right page. We have this evening our invocation by city manager Aaron Adams, and that'll be followed by the flag salute, and I will go ahead and do the flag salute. So if you could stand, please, for the invocation, followed by the flag salute. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, would you please bow your head with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, uh, we just give you thanks for this day and sort of the privilege to live and work in this, this great city. Um, Lord, we just come to you tonight and just the divisiveness that is going on in this country, this state, this city. Lord, you would just bring a calming effect on, on words and what people are using and the narrative and Lord, just uh, have your hand on the business of the city this evening, have your hand on the discernment and wisdom of the city council uh, conducting the important business of this city. Lord, we lift up our first responders, our police and fire personnel, healthcare workers, our teachers, and Lord, we just, uh, we just ask that you just continue to, to protect them uh, for those that are in harm's way. And um, we're just uh, grateful we're a grateful community here in the city of Temecula, and we know you will guide uh, the business of our community. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Aaron. So if you'd please put your right hand over your heart and repeat after me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And you may be seated. Madam City Clerk, we are virtual this evening. So in, in compliance with COVID mandates from the state. So could you please call the roll for me? Yes, Council Member Alexander. I'm here. Uh, Mayor Edwards. Here. Council Member Ron. I am here. Council Member Schwenk. And I'm here. Council Member Stewart. Here. Thank you. Uh, this evening we have um, more proclamations than, than usual because there is so much going on right now. So the first one is going to be Proclamation for National Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And we have um, Anjanette Oberg online from Mount San Jacinto Community College. So Randy, you have the proclamations. Could you please read them? I do. Hi, Anjanette, I see you. <laughs> I do, Madam Mayor. We actually have um, MSJC faculty here from the Asian Alliance to accept this proclamation, and we're so excited to have you all. So, Anjanette Oberg, um, Trakamai, Loda Cobb, and Marissa Jones. I'll go ahead and read the proclamation at this time. Whereas this May, during National Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we recognize the history and achievements of Asian Americans. Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, AANHPIs across our nation. And whereas these communities make our nation more vibrant through diversity of cultures, languages, and religions that enrich America's culture and society and strengthen the United States role as a global leader. And whereas AANHPI communities are deeply rooted in the history of the United States and the strength, contributions, and legacies of these communities have helped build and unite this country in each successive generation. And whereas we celebrate and honor the invaluable contributions of the AANHPI communities and those that they have made to our nation's culture and the arts, law, science, technology, sports, and public service, including the courageous AANHPIs who have served on the front lines of the pandemic as healthcare providers, first responders, teachers, and other essential workers. And whereas in spite of the strengths shown and the successes achieved, these communities have endured a long history of struggle in the inclusion, belonging, and acceptance space, generating a need for more awareness. And whereas locally in the summer of 2020, faculty, staff, and administrators at Mount San Jacinto College came together to form an Asian American Pacific Islander Alliance with the goals of supporting educational initiatives and promoting increased awareness of the AAPI experience and contributions to the college and our overall community. 
And whereas the main project of the Alliance was producing MSJC's first ever official AAPI Heritage Month celebration in the spring of 2021, and whereas the AAPI Alliance and its projects are strongly supported by MSJC as part of its bold and broad efforts to support equity initiatives, promote diversity, and foster deeper ties to the community. Now, therefore, you, Madam Mayor, Marianne Edwards, on behalf of the City Council of the City of Temecula, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2020 to be National Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And you call upon our community to learn more about the history of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and to observe this month with the appropriate programs and activities. And Madam Mayor, I know, like I said, we have some faculty members here to tell us a little more. Well, I see and Jeanette here, and I see Rick, Rick down there. Um, I don't know if I see anybody else, but welcome, both of you. So who would like to speak on behalf of MSJ Siri? Both of you can speak. Uh, I uh, so I'm Ashanette Oberg. Um, so I I have a little statement that we prepared. So thank you, Mayor and City Council members, for having us here and taking the time to formally acknowledge Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, our community. Um, I'm Professor Ajanet Aviao Oberg. I'm here tonight with Professor Truk Hamai. Professor Lota Cobb. Oh, hi. I see you now. And Director Marissa Jones. We're also here with our Dean Marissa. Carlos Tavaros, who's in our audience. Together, we served as the 2021 MSJC AAPI Alliance, created to celebrate our first Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and it's the first ever in the history of our college. This is a critical time in our history as a nation and as a community as we see anti-Asian sentiment and violence rising and a growing level of trauma within the community. With the passing of AB 1460, it's also a time where we are formally implementing ethnic studies in our general education coursework. And this AAPI series has reinforced the need and value of that curriculum. The AAPI community is the most diverse ethnic group representing over nearly 50 countries and over 100 languages. Each group has distinct cultures, religions, histories, traditions, and practices. Our goal as the Alliance was not just to celebrate the diversity of these cultures, but also to educate our campus and our community about the true history and diversity of the AAPI experiences. We sought to bring voice to cultures and people that are often misrepresented as model minorities. They are negatively stereotyped or they may even be treated as invisible altogether. Like so many other marginalized ethnic groups, the AAPI community has been excluded from educational, social, economic, and political opportunities, comprising just 3.8% of congressional offices. But we now proudly hold one very important position with Vice President Kamala Harris, who we hope represents the many opportunities that lie ahead for all diverse Americans. We thank the city of Temecula for the work that you have done most recently to show your commitment to diversity and equity. So thank you so much for the work you're doing in our community. And we thank you for the proclamation to support our AA NHPI community. We invite you to partner with MSJC moving forward in our equity pledge and join us as we stand in solidarity with other marginalized ethnic community members so that we can work collectively to affirm the rich and diverse ethnic identities, to celebrate the resilience and contributions of our progress and growth as a society, while also dismantling the barriers that impede our AAPI community members and our other ethnic groups and work to rebuild structures of empowerment, opportunity and success for all those that have been historically underrepresented in too many systems throughout our society. Together, may we continue to value the richness of cultural diversity that helps us collectively transform the lives of our MSJC students and our community in Temecula and beyond. Thank you so much for your time and your honor this evening. Uh, thank you, Anjanette. That We love MSJC and we're thrilled about the fact that you will be um, 
growing dramatically here in Temecula in what used to be the Abbott Research and Development Centers, uh, the two beautiful glass buildings that are on the corner of um, Solano Way and Margarita for the most part. And we are very, very thrilled. I keep telling people, I think it's gonna be the most amazing and outstanding community college campus in the country. We uh, do hope so. We and I think so. it absolutely will. And Temecula loves the fact that you're going to be here in a much bigger way. And however we can work with you, we are willing to work with you. And on behalf of the Temecula Valley Unified School District, um, you know, I know that Dr. Uh, Jody McClay is thrilled to have MSJC in town. And, you know, we always have already have a strong partnership between MSJC and TVUSD. And I think that's even going to grow uh, even bigger. So we look forward to working with you even more and even more closely. So, and thank you for, uh, you know, accepting this, um, this honor. Thank Does you. Anyone, would anyone else like to speak? Are you gonna do the talking for everyone? I will invite my colleagues to share <laughs> and if they would like. Anyone, if you just throw your hand up, I can see you, but go ahead. Nobody, okay, everybody's, everybody's got the shies tonight. We understand. Thank you all for being here. It means so much to us. And uh, again, we look forward to seeing you more often. Can I say one more thing? You absolutely may. We actually have our final closing uh, uh, AAPI movie series that's gonna be happening on Friday at six o'clock. So it's on our MSJC calendar, but we welcome all of you to join us. Those have proven to be very educational opportunities for us to learn about the true histories of the AAPI community. And they've also given us an opportunity to kind of grow in our solidarity and community with one another. So we invite you all to join us. Well, I wrote it down, so I'm gonna try and tune in if I can. And I encourage everybody else to do so. Thank you. All right, thank you again. And thank you for uh, you know, accepting this honor and, and uh, taking that uh, huge responsibility all right, so the next proclamation we have is for National Bike Month, and my friend Dale Borgeson is here, former commissioner, and Rick Vanderlinden is here, and I see Dale, hi, and I see Rick, hi, how are you, and I think council members, did we have something to share? Okay, so Zach is wearing his, and I have mine, and there's got Stu's, and I know Matt's got one, and Jessica's got one. So these are great, by the way. Thank you very much. So Randy also has a proclamation for you. Randy, could you go ahead and read that, please? Absolutely. So whereas May is National Bike Month as well, and it's promoted by the League of American Bicyclists and celebrated in communities from coast to coast. It was established in 1956, National Bike Month. It is a chance to showcase the many benefits of bicycling and encouraging more folks to give biking a try. And whereas the bicycle is an economical, healthy, convenient, environmentally sound form of transportation and an excellent tool for recreation and enjoyment of Temecula scenic beauty. And whereas throughout the month of May, the residents of Temecula and its visitors will experience the joys of bicycling through organized rides, bike trains, commuting events, or by simply getting out and going for a ride on their own. And whereas Temecula's bike lane and trail system attracts bicyclists each year, providing economic health, transportation, tourism, and scenic benefits. And whereas creating a bicycle friendly community has been shown to improve citizens' health, well being, and quality of life, growing the economy of Temecula, improving traffic safety, and reducing pollution and congestion. And whereas Hike Bike Temecula, the bike shop, Bike Temecula Valley, Inland Empire Biking Alliance, Inland Valley My Mountain Bike Association, League of American Bicyclists, and other local organizations and businesses will be promoting bicycling during the month of May 2021. And whereas these groups are also promoting bicycle tourism year round to attract more visitors to enjoy our local restaurants, hotels, retail establishments, and cultural and scenic attractions. And whereas these groups are also promoting greater public awareness of bicycle safety and operation, 
in an effort to reduce collisions, injuries, and fatalities and improve health and safety for everyone on the road. Now, therefore, you as Mayor Marianne Edwards, on behalf of the City Council, the City, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2021 to be National Bike Month, and you urge all residents to join in this special observation. Thank you, Randy. So, Dale, Rick, who you both want to speak, you're both more than welcome to, and I, I know you're both avid riders, and of course, Zach, uh, if you're going to see Zach around town, he's going to be on a bicycle. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'd like to say, um, this is Rick, I'd like to just say thank you to the city of Temecula for being such a great <laughs> supporter of cycling that's been our lives for so many people. And, um, and during the pandemic recently, um, I, I was the recent bike shop owner, we, we sold it just recently, but before that, uh, when, the, when COVID hit, it was amazing how many families were buying bikes and getting out and riding. We just loved, 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 loved seeing it. Um, and, and, since, and since then, we've started Bike Temecula Valley as a coalition to kind of represent the community. I, I, at the time, didn't realize how many out there really did love cycling. They just didn't know where to go or, uh, uh, or, or how to get into it. And so um, thank, thank you to the city. I mean, this is great. It's a great place to live. I've been here for 12 years, myself, my wife and I, and we as have been cyclists uh, are excited about this. Well, I, I can't say enough about the bike shop and um, most people might not know how generous you are uh, in giving bicycles to nonprofits and teaching kids how to ride and working with, uh, you know, low income families. And, um, you know, when I was the CEO of the Boys and Girls Clubs, I know that you did a lot for the clubs and for, for our kids too, and for Rotary Club of Temecula. Thank you for, on behalf of all my Rotarians. So uh, we know where we can find you on any given beautiful day, probably side by side with Dale and Zach. So Dale, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you. And uh, thanks for this recognition of um, Bicycle Month. Um, Rick and I and Zach and others are forming a coalition to develop and support safe riding around town. Um, look for me on my e-bike, passing Rick up without it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I hear the gauntlet being thrown at this oh, point. Oh yeah, bring it on, on Dale. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but I also want to uh, thank, of course, the City Council for their ongoing support uh, as evidenced in a uh, recent um, groundbreaking ceremony we just had just a few days ago for the Santa Gertrude, Gertrudis Creek Interconnect and other projects. Looking forward to the future. Our city staff is incredibly supportive of things happening within the bicycle community. So this is just the beginning of great things that will make Temecula even a, a bigger bicycle destination than it is currently. Thanks, Marianne. Oh, Thanks. you're welcome. You know that we're working hard to make sure that our trails interconnect so that you can go all over town and eventually, you know, maybe go on up to uh, Diamond Valley Lake and all the way up to Lake Elsinore. So, uh, you know, that'll put you on a, um, a path that's exclusive for bicycles and walkers. And so we love that idea. So does anybody want to say anything? Council member, Zach, you have to say something. <laughs> uh, the, the default bike guy, I got to say something. Um, thank you, Marianne. Um, you know, thanks to, to Rick and Dale for uh, accepting this on behalf of Bike Temecula Valley and really the community as a whole. Dale, you mentioned a couple projects and, and as we see in the next, you know, in the coming months, we'll see more projects and, and, and gosh, the pump track. And, you know, we start talking about all the things that we've been doing for uh, like the community as a whole, just to get out. They just happen to be bicycling, which is, is a great benefit for the community. So. You will certainly see me on my bike around town. Uh, I have rode to here tonight, and uh, it's just a great way to be outside, to be active, and to really connect with your community, which I think is the most important part uh, of it. So um, obviously, thanks to the council for uh, proclaiming uh, this as a bike month, and, and thanks to Dale and Rick for accepting on behalf of uh, Bike to Mecca Valley and the community. So thank well, you. Well, thank you all for your promotion of such a very healthy and wonderful sport, because it allows you to see all of Temecula. If you, if you ride long enough, you'll get to see all of it. So on behalf of the city council, congratulations for all that you've done for the community. And Dale, how many years did you teach? 34. 34, and you hardly look 34. <laughs> Just uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And he Thanks. literally knows every person in Temecula. Just I know he does. Five minutes. <laughs> I know he does. Um, well, and no, that's, that's what happens when you keep riding your bike all over town. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so, and Rick, Thank you again for your generosity through the bike shop. And uh, Zach, I heard that gauntlet hit the floor, so you better get busy. Okay, thanks, you guys. Thank you.
Okay, the next proclamation is for, Na oh, this, this is a great one, National Public Works Week. And we do this every year and people have no idea how important public works is, but it's everything that you think it is. So um, I've got Pat Thomas here uh, on behalf of Public Works as our representative. So Pat, there you are. You're like me, you're, there you go. Your camera's not low enough. <laughs> So congratulations again on National Public Works Week. And I, you, you know, what you tell us um, every year when we do this is um, I learn something every year about wh what is public works first? Tell us what public works is. Well, public works is uh, the part of our organization that provides for the city's infrastructure. So uh, the, the public works department, uh, we, we summarize it by saying we, plan, design, and build all of the, uh, and, and then maintain all of the infrastructure for the city. And that includes the roads, the, the drainage systems, the parks, the city facilities. So everything that, uh, that is infrastructure that is used and enjoyed by the public. So those are those things that we use and see every day. And sometimes we take those for granted. Um, you know, we know we have beautiful parks, um, you know, second to nine forty one. And we know how hard you work to stay on top of the road issues. It's not easy in California. Uh, you know, we have droughts and heat and rain, and then we have, you know, the roads can be undermined sometimes. And that's when we get potholes. And we know that you, your guys are out on pothole alert every single day <laughs> and very responsive. So, um, absolutely. So, I'm going to have, go ahead, Randy. You want to read the uh, National Public Works Week? proclamation for Pat and all of his uh, brothers and sisters in public works. I would love to read the proclamation for our public works family. Uh, whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure facilities and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life and well-being of the people of Temecula. And whereas these infrastructure facilities and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in Temecula to gain knowledge of and to maintain a progressive interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas the quality and effectiveness of these services, as well as their planning, design, and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skills of the public works personnel. And whereas the year 2021 marks the 61st annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association and the Canadian Public Works Association. Now, therefore, you as Mayor Marianne Edwards, on behalf of the City Council of the City of Temecula, hereby proclaim the week of May 6th to the 22nd, 2021 to be National Public Works Week, uh, Stronger Together, and urge all citizens to join with representatives of the American Public Works Association and Canadian Public Works Association and government agencies in the activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals engineers, managers, and employees to recognize the substantial contributions they make to protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. That's excellent. So Pat, one of the, the largest things that you've done in the last you know, year or so is to change out every street light in Temecula. How many, how many poles and lights was it? We have about 7,500 street lights in Temecula. And as you said, we took over ownership of those and uh, changed them all to LEDs. So they now use a fraction of the amount of electricity and our cost for that program is, is a fraction of what it used to be under Southern California is. And we've already saved how much? We know this is the first year. We're saving uh, about $800,000 a year. That's an amazing, that's an amazing statistic. So we will have uh, recouped our costs, um, what, four or five years, maybe six? At, at, about, at about five years, we'll yeah. have recovered all of our costs and then we'll just have that savings going forward every year in the future. Yeah, it's amazing. And if people will notice uh, looking out at their street lights now, um, not yellow anymore, but we're still observing the Palomar ordinance to protect the telescope that's above the, you know, up on Palomar Mountain up above us. 
uh, and the light doesn't bleed into the sky like it used to with the yellow ones. And yet they, um, they illuminate more of the ground area than the yellow ones did. So yeah, it's right. much better. I, I love walking out and actually seeing what color something is. <laughs> and I love saving that money too. So yeah. on behalf of the city council, thanks everybody in, in public works for us. I, I had a, few more, a few more comments for you. If I can add a few more things, sure. Mayor Edwards. I wanted to say thank you, uh, Mayor and, and council members on behalf of the 55 uh, public works employees that proudly serve the city of Temecula. And uh, you saw the, the poster that we have every year and the theme Stronger Together. It's a it's a national, it's sponsored by the uh, American Public Works Association, which is a national organization that we uh, belong to. So it's recognized throughout the country the week of May 16th to 22nd. And we're going to do uh, uh, some different things this year. We actually, we've got our uh, social media team that's producing uh, a series of, uh, of video clips of our projects and, and employees working out in the field. And they'll be, they'll be displaying those on our social media channels next week during during Public Works Week. And I also wanted to just uh, give a special call out to Greg Butler, who, uh, as you know, has been a large part of, of Public Works and infrastructure in, in Temecula for over 20 years. I think this is gonna be his last uh, Public Works Week here in Temecula. So I wanted to uh, give a special congratulations to Greg. Well, we thank Greg too, and I voted no on retirement. So that didn't seem to go over too well. So anyway, I think he's going to go, but uh, Greg knows how much we love and appreciate him. And we understand how difficult that job can be dealing with contracts and so many different projects. And we just finished our first preliminary budget review. And my goodness, capital improvement budget is the biggest it's ever been. And Temecula is doing the best it's ever done. So um, we come back in great shape. And a lot of that's attributed to you and your department. So please thank everyone for us. And congratulations on another National Public Works Week. Stu's got, Stu has a comment. Yes. I'll put a plug in for the T City of Temecula app because that is a valuable tool for these guys because obviously we don't have enough guys out in the field to know where the potholes are or any you know, major street issues are going on. And the city app actually has a, a way that you can literally pinpoint exactly where you want them to go to fill that pothole or to look at that street. And it's, it's hugely beneficial because it bypasses everybody and goes straight to uh, public works. So please download, download the uh, City of Temecula app because once you do, you know, you'll, you'll never have to pick up a phone again to, uh, to get somebody on, on the horn. So it's a great app. So please download it. And more often than not, those potholes are filled within 24 hours of when they're reported. So that's a, that's a remarkable uh, time frame. So thank you. Because uh, we know that's one of the things that's really important to people. So thank you, Pat. And congratulations. You're welcome. And thank you again. You're welcome. Okay, Randy, so the last one is update regarding the city's responsible compassion and homeless outreach efforts. And Kevin Hawkins is gonna do this one. And I believe this was at the request of council member Alexander, was it not? It was, yes. It was. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Madam Mayor. And you're right, Public Works is awesome. And so, um, you know, several years ago, you recall quite well, as other cities were struggling to get a handle on the growing impact of homelessness in their communities, the Temecula City Council directed staff to proactively address this challenge in a compassionate yet very responsible and results-oriented fashion. You know, since then that approach has become the successful model in the region, but we have also had some changes in the last council update or since the last council update. And it's really just time for some reintroduction. So, to kick off those introductions in this presentation is Mike Wooten, the Administrative Services Manager out of Community Services. So, Mike. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, first, I'm gonna share my screen. Let's make sure this works. Okay, I think we're good there. Okay, there we go. So, uh, good evening, Mayor Edwards and members of the council. My name is Mike Wooten, Administrative Services Manager in our Community Services Department. And I'm also joined by Sergeant Ed Harding from the Riverside Sheriff's Department and Aaron Petroff from SWAG. Tonight we'll be providing an update on the Homeless Outreach and Prevention Program, provide some background information, and introduce you to our teams. So to start with a little background, 
Thanks to the support and vision of Mayor Edwards and her council colleagues, Temecula's Homeless Outreach and Prevention Program was established in 2014 in response to growing homelessness in the city. Uh, I believe it was actually Mayor Edwards who first coined the term responsible compassion. Uh, so this program uh, addresses homelessness by focusing on collaboration, coordination, and communication, not only between us here tonight, but also with our community partners and neighboring cities that are part of our regional homeless alliance. So unfortunately, uh, due in large part to different socioeconomic factors and decriminalization efforts, Riverside County, along with much of the state, has seen a significant increase in its homeless population. In fact, from 2017 to 2020, the county as a whole has seen an increase of over 1,200 homeless individuals, equaling uh, approximately 76% increase. Uh, locally, however, as a result of the efforts that have taken place since the formation of the RHA, the cities within its territory have seen a 17% decrease uh, in their homeless populations based on official pit count numbers. Temecula specifically has seen its pit count totals decrease from 85 in 2017 to 59 in 2020. Uh, as you know, the pit count was canceled this year, so we're not able to get updated uh, 2021 figures, but we anticipate this count returning next year, and we're making a strong push to further decrease those numbers. I would like to point out, however, that the pit count, it is just a snapshot, um, and that's why we also do our own internal uh, census following the pit count, which is a much more comprehensive effort. Um, so on this slide, you'll see uh, since the creation of the Homeless Outreach and Prevention Program in 2014, there are numerous steps we've taken to address homelessness, some of which are highlighted here. Some of these actions include partnering with faith-based faith organizations and community partners, such as CMOH and Project Touch, to develop an effective response to the growing number of homelessness. Uh, the formation of the Five City Regional Homeless Alliance, with each of the cities working to update their quality of life ordinances for consistency to better address homelessness. Uh, in 2018, two additional deputies were added to bring the total to four that are dedicated to homeless outreach. And the city of Temecula was also awarded CDBG funding to launch the Homeless Prevention and Diversion Program to provide limited financial assistance to those at risk of becoming homeless. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, the city uh, first entered into an agreement with SWAG to provide outreach services. So with all that, uh, now I'd like to introduce you to our team. Um, so it's, uh, you can see quite a few people here. Um, so our team is made up of city staff, the sheriff department's homeless outreach team and our outreach provider, uh, SWAG or social work action group. Uh, as I previously mentioned, I have a couple guests with me tonight, uh, to discuss the, re uh, respective shops and I'll be introducing them to talk about the roles on the team and also go over some stats that you'll find useful. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Sergeant Ed Harding with the Riverside Sheriff's homeless outreach team. He leads a team of four deputies and a dedicated community services officer. These deputies are in, in many cases, the ones to make first contact with homeless individuals and begin the work of building trust necessary to connect them to the most appropriate path uh, to stability. So with that, uh, I'll pass this portion of the presentation on to Sergeant Harding. Good evening and thank you for having me. Um, happy to be here. Uh, one thing I want to talk about our team is just the deputies that we have assigned to it, including our community service officer. You, we have Curtis, Chris, John, Kurt, and George. Uh, they're wonderful additions to this team. They really have compassion for uh, the homeless out there. So although, as you can see from the stats we have here, just from the last uh, March and April stats, we do have several arrests that obviously that's our uh, job. However, the biggest goal is to try to outreach as much as possible to the homeless out there. Um, my, my team's amazing when they get out there. They know everybody by name. They know where they're at. They know what they need. Um, and unfortunately, there is some uh, problems with uh, our homeless as far as them having, you know, their typical addiction problems and a hard time getting off the streets. And what our uh, deputies like to do along with the city and swag when we're out there is show the compassion that we want them to help. And in, at times it'll take maybe 10, 15 times of contacting these individuals. And when we do, there'll be that time they actually uh, you know, take that the olive branch and they really wanna come off the streets and um, get the help. And as you can see where we, like in March, we have the nine attempts. Those are people that we are attempting to get off the streets. They wanna do it, but out of the nine, we're having seven to actually get off the streets. And with the help with the city, with SWAG and all the resources that we have been able to develop with this team, we are able to get them transportation, either back to their homes or where they came from, 
uh, get them off the streets to rehabilitation centers or um, even get them some shelter if they need temporary shelter until they get on their feet. So um, as I mentioned, our team is in a great position where we can mainly focus on solving or at least uh, helping the homeless situation we have going on in the city. And um, with that being said, is there any questions or anything further, Mike? No, no, thank you, uh, Sergeant. That, that was perfect. Um, oh, so do, I, do I have one second? I almost, are you still there? Still here. Okay, <laughs> I apologize. I just wanted to add on top of that, a lot of uh, our homeless, do they do uh, struggle a little bit with uh, mental illness. And with that, we have what we have a CBAT team that we have assigned here as well. Um, and there are a uh, county behavioral assessment team. And what they do is when we have, uh, they have mental issues, they'll come out and see if they need help uh, with mental facilities or wherever it needs to be done so that they can get um, assistance with uh, whatever uh, illness that they're dealing with. Um, so I just wanted to add them. I don't, they always seem to be left out um, of what we're doing and um, our resources, but they are a huge resource to our team as well. So I apologize for uh, that, Mike, to interrupt, but uh, I just want to throw that out there. No problem. Uh, thank you, yeah. Sergeant. Uh, so the next person I'd like to introduce is Aaron Petroff from SWAG. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, SWAG as part of the team. Um, they are the contracted outreach providers who are experts in their field that connect homeless people to the resources necessary uh, to secure or obtain treatment and housing. Uh, so I'd like to hand this over to Aaron to provide a little more info on SWAG um, and also the results we've seen since entering into a new agreement earlier this year. So Aaron. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Leadership, um, law enforcement. You know, it's it's truly a blessing for us to be a part of this team. Our mission is to serve those individuals that are most in need, those individuals who are not asking for help. And and what Mike had said earlier, um, homelessness is, as we know, is is running rampant really across the state. It's not unique to Temecula. Um, and Temecula, it's a beautiful community and it's a giving community. And so that, you know, that in and of itself attracts panhandlers. And so what our mission is, it's twofold. You know, we want to educate the community. And our, our one ask is always, please do not give to panhandling. That supports uh, individuals' addiction. That supports them remaining on the streets. Um, and second is, you know, allowing us this opportunity to be part of a team. Um, homelessness is so touches so many aspects of human life. Um, the, the main barriers, as mentioned by Sergeant Hardy and Mike earlier, is mental health and substance abuse. Um, people aren't out on the streets. They're not, uh, they're not enjoying life. Um, it's not something that they've, uh, there was an easy choice. You know, they may have made that first choice many years ago to um, begin to dabble into substance abuse um, and or, you know, mental health that kind of spiraled out of control. And so we're there to provide inspiration um, to get off the streets, to get the help they need. Um, there's systems of care for mental health and substance abuse via the county, which are successful when somebody wants that help 100%. And we're like a stopgap. We want to help inspire those individuals who are on the fence um, and often because they're so deep in their addiction or deep in their mental health illness. And we absolutely cannot do that alone. Um, our partners with the city, with Mike and Mark and uh, law, law enforcement team, amazing uh, community mission of hope and um, Project Touch. Um, we, we need as many resources as possible. Um, when somebody is ready to get off the streets, we have to strike and we have to act immediately. And through those partners, we're able to do that. Um, you know, I can't stress enough. Sheriff's Department, they're our number one ally. Um, the people on the streets are, are needing a push, you know, they know if you, if you went out and asked anybody, you know, they're, if they were truthful, they'll admit they know the help is available. They know they need to get it, but often they're so broken um, or, and, or it seems so overwhelming that they can't accomplish that on their own. So we help in a perfect situation, we help provide multiple avenues for them to exit life on the streets. And I mean, not, not, it's not anything unique to homelessness, but I think change for all of us is not always an easy, um, an easy thing to, to take on. And so quite often what happens is um, we, along with law enforcement, work hard to build a rapport, um, provide an avenue off the streets, and then um, come treatment date, um, they get cold feet. And, you know, we, we never force anybody, we can't force anybody into getting treatment. Um, neither can anybody else. But, you know, because Sheriff's Department has developed a relationship with the people on the streets, by nature, they're often trespassing, um, aggressively panhandling, 
under the influence, you know, which are all um, issues that law enforcement deals with. And so um, when we work cohesively like we have, um, that's when we see those resources. And, um, you know, this second year that we've been with uh, Temecula, um, it's been amazing. We've really been able to define, um, you know, our roles and what we are, um, what each one of the partners are best at. And, it, you know, it's, it's been a great partnership and, and we appreciate the proactive approach. Um, homelessness is going to continue to grow. Unfortunately, um, addiction is running rampant and we have to go at it. We have to attack it and we have to continue to do what we're doing with this team, targeting those most in need, not just waiting for people to say, I'm ready. Um, you know, we have to, we have to inspire people to change. Um, you know, again, we are, we are a part of a team that is here to serve. Um, I know the sheriff's department, you know, it's, it's service above self. I love that. You know, I love that motto. Um, you know, we, I, if they didn't have it, we would have it. Um, but we're a part of that team and we want to continue to serve those in Temecula that are most broken, that can't serve themselves um, because ultimately it trans lates into an overall quality of life, a better quality of life for the entire community. So um, again, we're, we're, we're blessed to be a part of this team um, and uh, we're, we're here to serve. So we're, we're open to, um, you know, continuing this relationship and, and being a part of the solution. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Aaron. So is there anyone else? I did have a couple more slides I wanted to go over. Uh, All right, Mayor. let's go. All right, so uh, so now I'd like to introduce you to the city's portion of the team. Um, so this includes myself, uh, community services coordinator to Mark Martinez, uh, and Patrice Brown, who's a project senior recreation leader. Uh, not pictured here, uh, but two people that also help support uh, our division in, in addition to their normal duties, our management analyst, analyst Lacey Sisler and office specialist to Crystal Menzimer. So our team, uh, really our role, uh, we coordinate all the collaborative efforts between our agencies and community partners. Uh, we manage the contractor activities, uh, coordinate encampment cleanups on city and flood control property. Uh, we work with qual qualifying clients on CDBG funding continuously are evaluating services and outcomes, and we also staff the Help Center. Um, so speaking of the Help Center, um, in 2018, uh, the city repurposed this underutilized facility to create an access center for at-risk at individuals in need of resources. Uh, so there, case management, outreach and in-reach events, limited financial assistance, life skills, computer access, and hygiene supplies are all offered there. Uh, so now looking forward, um, there are some goals we have in place um, that we feel will help strengthen the homeless outreach uh, program. Uh, for example, uh, we're finalizing the business toolkit uh, that will both educate and offer ways to address homeless concerns that businesses experience. We'll be exploring ways to enhance the Regional Homeless Alliance. We'll follow up next year's pick count with our own internal homeless census. Uh, we'll continue to advocate at the county level for resources for Temecula. Um, and we'll evaluate encampment cleanup processes to see where we can be more efficient, explore grant opportunities, and at the request of Councilmember Alexander, we'll work with Public Works and community, de community development staff to develop a trash enclosure, enclosure incentive program for local business. And then lastly, um, I'm gonna piggyback off what Aaron said. Um, I just wanna end with a reminder to the public uh, to please not give to panhandlers. Um, and I've listed some do's and don'ts of responsible compassion here. Uh, and you know, again, as, as Aaron's mentioned, we're lucky to live in such a generous community, uh, but sometimes that generosity could actually be hurting someone more than you're helping. So instead, we wanna recommend giving to or donating your time with one of the local organizations that does help these individuals. And of course, we always want to treat them all with respect, but this can still be done while not encouraging individuals to continue panhandling. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time and we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Anyone have any questions before we get to the proclamation? Yes, please. Stu, I hear you. Yes. Um, okay, so you mentioned about panhandlers. I'm kind of curious, um, and probably the sergeant would be the one to answer that. Do you find there are panhandlers in our city that aren't actually homeless? Or are most of these homeless people? You know, I, I've kind of heard it both directions and I'm kind of curious. Uh, that was actually a really good question. Um, at times, that will be the case. I mean, majority is gonna be your, your local transients, but we, believe it or not, we've actually caught some teenagers out there throwing on some raggy shirts and trying to get some money out at, you know, the excess at the freeway. So it does happen, but it's very rare. Um, typically, it will be a, um, a, a local transient or a homeless individual. Does that help? Yes. 
Jessica. Unmute. <laughs> that was so good too. Okay, so anyways, uh, <laughs> Mr. Wooten, I just wanna say thank you for what you guys do, uh, Sergeant Harding and Aaron Petroff, am I saying that right? You guys all make an incredible team. I, 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 like I told you last time, our last meeting, and I've told you several times, I absolutely enjoyed going out there and seeing uh, what teamwork is all about and really caring for these individuals who are in a really desperate position in a lot of ways. And so I just wanna thank you guys and your team for all that you're doing. Uh, and I see our city moving forward together uh, to be able to solve. Now, it's never going to be solved, but just to, just to make it a better situation for everybody. But um, one of the things I know we had brought up uh, was about even I want to encourage people to maybe have a community cleanup. Um, I know Mr. Wooten, you had said that that was a possibility. So whoever's listening today, you know, more hands, less work. So uh, it'd be incredible to be able to get people out there to see what's going on, too. So again, I encourage our city council members, our mayor, um, anybody who's really interested in going out to kind of seeing what differences we can make as a community would be incredible. Um, and then the help center was really a great resource as well for these people. So if, uh, if our public, if anybody here in Temecula sees uh, somebody, just direct them right to that help center because we have, um, we have 501c3s dropping things off over there, uh, clothes, uh, food, handouts. I mean, there's so many things that are just such a blessing to people. And so I just continue to encourage you to send them there and just let them get the help that they're needing. So uh, again, I want to thank uh, all the officers, the team members, keep up the great work. Um, I just love seeing what, what's going on. So thank you. Thank you. So I, I want you guys to know that, I, I think you know this already, that Responsible Compassion was written on a napkin one, one Saturday morning when Tom and I were having breakfast at the Swing Inn in Old Town. And it started out as a very, um, you know, the, the, the concept of it was very simple. It, and it was a three-pronged approach. Literally, it took me 20 minutes to, to jot down the approach. But it started with um, the, the first um, leg of the three-legged stool is to locate, assess, document, and then offer help to the homeless that we have. And people don't realize that you have um, emergency medical information on each one of them. So if, if they're found unconscious on the street, when the paramedics arrive, you know what kind of drugs they might be taking, what medications they're taking, and what uh, underlying uh, conditions that they might have. And um, people may not also may not realize that you stay with these homeless, not that you live with them, but you continue to make contact over sometimes long periods of time. Uh, there's a lot of distrust, um, you know, among the homeless community for, for good reason. And, you know, they've been mistreated or, you know, they're on drugs and anything like that. So they're very vulnerable. So you continue to meet with them and reassure them and, and uh, until they get to that point where they're no longer afraid and they're, they're actually willing to accept help. But it doesn't stop there. You actually help them uh, either locate family members and they can be clear across the country. And, and we just don't put them on a bus and forget about it. We contact those family members. We make sure that they realize that, that this person is, you know, we, that we've located this person. And I know the response is very often, oh my gosh, we've been looking for her for six years. And you know they had no idea where their sister, their aunt, their brother, their, their cousin was. And so now we found them and we make sure that they're willing to take them in to continue whatever treatment that they need or support their efforts to become you know, clean and sober and to find a job. And then and only then do we um, help them arrange transport and, and send them home to be with family. And then I know you do follow up after that. So it is, indeed a process. And then the second thing is strong law enforcement. It is our obligation to protect our residents and to protect Temecula's quality of life. So the second leg was strong law enforcement. And so um, they have respect for you and they know that if they're breaking the law, they're going to be arrested. And so if they have outstanding warrants or if they're in possession of drugs, they're arrested, they're taken to the jail. And depending on you know, what the violation is, they may stay, they may be booked into the jail. A lot of times they're not, and they're back in Temecula, uh, you know, to, to start all over again. But what that has done is reinforce in their minds the fact that you are compassionate, but you're responsible to the residents as well. 
And so he helped to kind of break up their day. The main thing is for a lot of them is maintaining that drug connection with the, their drug dealer. And so if they have to break up their day and go spend some time in the jail, uh, they're uncomfortable doing that because they've lost touch with their drug dealer. So the second leg is the strong law enforcement. And then we talked about the third leg and that is enlightening the public. And there's a great book and it's called When Helping Hurts. I don't know the author, but it explains in great detail and from a psychological standpoint, how giving money or clothing or food just allows them to live in filth and addiction one more day. So um, really giving them those things really hurts them because it'll, it's enabling them to continue that lifestyle, which is, you know, it's dangerous, it's not healthy, it shortens their lives. So um, we enlightened the public and we handed out, I think 25,000 door hangers to homes in Temecula when we first started. Uh, and we've got flyers and we publish things uh, on the city website. There's a complete uh, overview of responsible compassion, which by the way, I use the re words responsible and compassion, not necessarily in that order, but the, the, the name came from Mr. Kevin, the Hawk Hawkins. And he named it Responsible Compassion. And I still have the napkin where he wrote it on my napkin. And so it's framed and it's at home. Um, and so that is the key. When, when the public realizes not to give them handouts um, or to be firm if they ask for, you know, if we have panhandling and, they, and to say no, um, that discourages them. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't enable them for one more day. So we want them to get to the point where they're willing to accept help. They know they need help and we're right there to help them. It, it's, um, it's been such a successful program in Temecula. When you talk about the coalition, all the cities up and down the 15 freeway up through Canyon Lake have, have joined the coalition with us and our officers and our city personnel get together and all the way up to Menifee and the county of Riverside and also the city of Escondido's looked at it and the city of Santa Ana actually, or was it Orange? It was Orange actually contacted us and asked if they could use that model and they have done so. Um, and it is very effective because it, it's, it's balanced, it's compassionate, we're responsible to the residents and the residents are now enlightened knowing that giving them food, clothing or uh, money does not help. So that is just a really uh, quick outline of the three-legged uh, program called Responsible Compassion. And I always say, if I never do anything for the rest of my life, I will be very, very proud of that program because of the difference it makes in our community and the difference it makes in the lives of those individuals that we help uh, you know, find a new life, usually at home with uh, friends and family. So we couldn't do it without, you know, it takes a tremendous team. And we're very fortunate that we have this team. Most cities do not have uh, the, you know, they don't have the capacity to be able to um, staff a program like this. So thank you everybody for your continuous work. It makes a huge difference in lives and the life and quality of life in Temecula. So thank you all. We surely appreciate it. And we'd like to have you back, you know, to give us regular reports. So thank you. Anybody have any questions? Are we sure? Zach. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, I just really don't want to let this moment pass without really just saying thank you to Mike and the team for what they do. Um, truly, this is a, an extremely complex issue uh, that we all face as a community. And, uh, and seeing how they interface and how they, how they, um, how they participate in this process and, and really helping us solve this issue um, is, is important to me. I think when you look at that presentation, um, you know, the thing that pops out to me is quality of life investment, right? Quality of life investment for our residents, but also it's a quality of life investment for um, our residents who are experiencing homelessness. This is truly an outreach to help and to educate and to really bring the community arms around these folks and get them the help they need. So I just don't want to let that pass. Um, there's a lot of good works going on with, uh, with our homeless outreach team and city staff and swag. So just thank you. Um, you're doing an amazing job. So I just really appreciate you all. Thank you, Zach. Anybody else? I don't see anybody else on my screen. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, we're on to board and commission reports. Eric Levine, I saw your face up there a few minutes ago. Community Services Commission. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Good uh, evening. Your, your Community Services Commission uh, met virtually last night. 
And among the highlights, we received two presentations, one on the city's work program to update the quality of life master plan, and the other on uh, the draft CIP projects. And uh, how timely is this? On Saturday, May 15th, this coming Saturday, we have a bike month open house. You can visit us at Nicholas Road Park from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and get an update on our trails, enjoy the free giveaways, and follow the book walk. And if you want to know what a book walk is, because I sure did, <laughs> a book walk is an outdoor reading experience where pages of a children's book are attached to individual signs and placed along a walking or biking trail. I love that. So you can read your book as you walk or bike along. Visit Hike Bike Temecula on Facebook for more information. And lastly, on Saturday, May 29th, the Temecula Valley Symphony's Winds, Brass, and Percussion will be performing an old-fashioned concert in observance of Memorial Day. It'll pre premiere on Facebook at Temecula Parks and Rec. That concludes my report, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Eric? No, I love the book idea. As long as nobody, you know, crashes into the person in front of them while they're trying to read. <laughs> that, that did go through my head, but that's a cool idea. Well, just everybody, tell everybody to be careful. And I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun. It sounds like a lot of fun. Zach, are you going to go? Absolutely. And uh, it's uh, the book walk, the book bike. Don't worry. You stop to read. We, we're not reading while we're, we're oh. <laughs> We'll be okay. <laughs> you pull over. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad that makes me feel a little better as a mother and a grandmother. So <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Eric. Okay, we have Ross Jackson from the Old Town Local Review Board. Hi, Ross. I know he's there. I think he's there. Randy, is he there? Madam Mayor, I do not see him. Okay. Mayor, I searched for the panelists and I don't see him as uh, logged in. Yeah, I just scanned down all of my uh, participants and I didn't see him, but okay. So then you know what? We'll go on to Commissioner John Telesio from the Planning Commission. Maybe. Oh, as soon as I get myself in the living, I am. Hi, neighbor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and City Council and all those folks out there in Zoom land. Uh, we had six items on the May 5th, 2021 Planning Commission agenda, which has been known lately as a heavy load. The commission received a presentation of the staff on the city program update to the quality of life master plan as they did with the community services folks. The commission re reviewed an amendment to the fiscal year 2021-25 capital improvement program for consistency with the general plan. The amendment will add the Mary Phillips Senior Center Emergency Generator Project. The commission voted for nothing to make a determination that the proposed amendment is in concurrence with the general plan. The commission also approved three separate development plan applications for three industrial buildings ranging in size from 17,320 square feet to 33,636 square feet. The projects are located in the industrial park on Avenida Alvarado West of Sierra, also way. There were no public comments for these items and, and the commission voted 4 0 to approve the application. Nice looking buildings, by the way, to keep, keep building those. We have people with jobs. The commission approved a conditional use permit to allow the existing Mad Madeline restaurant in Old Town to upgrade their alcohol beverage control type 41 license to a type 47 to allow the sale of the still spirits. There was no, there was one public comment for the item and the commission voted 4-0 to approve the application. And that's all I have. Any questions or comments? Any questions, anybody? Well, John, I think you gave such a comprehensive re report that nobody has any questions. Or well, they're all asleep. No, I'm looking right at them. They're all awake. Okay, I didn't <laughs> bore them to. I didn't bore them to sleep. Then that's good. No, no, you, you didn't. 
And we know you guys have been busy, amazing, uh, the job you've done during the whole COVID thing, and you've been busier than ever. Well, that's why I called six a heavy load, because we hadn't seen that many, but six is our high number for this year. Wow, that's amazing. Well, you're doing great work. Keep it up. Thank you. Remember to eat your Wheaties. Okay, then we're going to move on to the public safety report. And we have with us Captain John Crater from CAL FIRE. Hi, Madam Mayor, uh, City Council staff, and uh, Temecula residents. Um, uh, thank you tonight. We were talking a lot about mental health, and uh, I'm going to segue a little bit instead of doing my, uh, my numbers here, but I'll get to them. Uh, mental health is uh, a big deal this month. Uh, the International Firefighter Association um, actually is Suicide Prevention Month for first responders. Uh, we're losing more firefighters to suicide than we are line of duty death. Uh, that's why I wanted to kind of push this message out uh, to the public. If, if you know a firefighter, live with a firefighter, or you are a firefighter, there's help out there for you. Uh, in CAL FIRE, we have, uh, you know, peer support. Uh, we have a pretty good, uh, robust plan here in the county of Riverside that we're building on. And that's just a peer saying, hey, are you okay? Uh, here's some resources. Uh, and then when we move into the state, we have 11 battalion chiefs that uh, actually handle our employee support services program and, and help match uh, our firefighters with uh, professional counselors. And then we move into the employee, um, you know, uh, assistance program where they actually could go to retreats. Center of Excellence is one. Matt Ron knows that uh, very well. So um, I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, if I didn't talk about that a little bit. Uh, we went through a historic fire season, went through a pandemic that we're, we're really still in, even though it's waning. Uh, and we're going right into another fire season. So I just wanted everybody out there to, to realize um, that there's programs and, uh, and we are dealing with uh, really our own issues with firefighters taking their own lives more than they're dying in the line of duty. And that needs to be addressed. So as the fire chief of Temecula, I want you to know I support all these programs. Uh, we care about our employees, and uh, if anybody out there needs help, please reach out. Uh, I'll get to my presentation now. Thank you. All right, City of Temecula for the month of April 2021. Uh, we ran a total of uh, 763 calls for service, uh, one commercial structure fire, one multifamily uh, structure fire, which would be an apartment complex. Uh, five other fires, uh, those could be uh, other than determined. And uh, three residential fires, uh, 64 traffic collisions, eight wildland and vehicle fires, and 569 medical related calls in the city. Next slide, please. Uh, on the plan review and inspections on our fire prevention side for the month of April 2021, uh, we completed uh, 420 uh, plan reviews. Uh, constructions inspections, we completed 338. Annual inspections, 917. And here at City Hall, uh, over-the-counter uh, public inquiries, 12. I bring this picture up. Um, my neighbor actually painted it. Her name is oh, uh, Kath, Kathy Fox. Uh, we oh, were talking. Oh, sorry, we were talking one day, and uh, we had a fire behind the, our house, and she uh, seen the planes and the coordinated attack of the ground resources, and we started talking, and um, she said, "You know, I." I'd like to paint something, so I commissioned her to do so, uh, and she named it A View into Cal Fire. Um, beautiful, you know, it, it's, uh, 
she really put a lot of time and effort into this. I gave her some reference materials, some pictures uh, that go back to when I started my career in 1994. Um, you know, on here you see community, you see, you know, uh, uh, different rescues, you see all the aspects that we do in the fire service. Um, my deal with this was I, I didn't want to keep it in my office and, and just keep it to myself. So I reached out to the city and actually loaned it to them so they could display it um, maybe in city hall or, or where other, wherever they, they choose to do so. So the public has access to be able to enjoy this painting. Um, a couple of things here. Um, Kathy's here tonight. I, I, I hope she speaks on this, but I just want to, you know, acknowledge her tremendous talent and thank her for this beautiful description of the day-to-day -day challenges faced by the and heroism demonstrated by CAL FIRE staff uh, here in the city and throughout the state. So, Kathy, if you'd like to say a few words about uh, the inspiration for this painting. Well, it's remarkable while we're waiting for her. It's, it's, and some of these look like photographs. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi everybody. Hi, this is great. Thank you for having me here. And I, 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 I'm so happy and so pleased that, that John loves it so much. And it's really wonderful that everybody sees it, uh, thinks it's beautiful and it's wonderful. And I'm really honored that it's going to be hung in a, a public enough place for lots of people to be able to see it. How big is this? What size is this painting? Yes, they give you, the picture doesn't give you the scale, but it's three feet by four feet. Wow, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And some of these do look like photographs that are just, you know, stuck up there. They're so good. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you. As she was progressing through this, I think it was seven month process for this yeah. painting. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I get a little sneak peek here and there and, and, uh, but never did I imagine when she said it's done. And I, I went over to her house and looked at this, this work of art. Uh, my jaw hit the floor and I said, yeah. this, this can't sit in my office. So speechless. Yeah, I was, and I want to. I want to thank uh, Kathy for, you know, painting this. It's it's just uh, it's something that everybody needs to enjoy and and look at. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kathy. This it it is truly remarkable, and I cannot wait to see it in person. Um, thank you. It's incredible. So I uh, I understand it's it's hung and it's in the um, the permit center. Oh, I'm going to go through there tonight on my way home then. <laughs> that is remarkable. You really captured the spirit of uh, Cal Fire in the community and on the job. Hey, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, you wouldn't get some more requests to do things like this of different uh, careers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, John, maybe she needs a manager. No, I'm good. <laughs> I got enough stuff going on. <laughs> well, thank you. I do support her. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. You did a beautiful job. And thank you, John, for, uh, you know, having such a great neighbor and having the wherewithal to go and ask her to do something like this. It's remarkable. Was there any questions from uh, the stats or any of uh, my presentation from the council? Any questions, anyone? I think everybody's so taken with the, the picture. I don't see any hands going up, but I tell you, a lot of people are going to be uh, exiting through uh, the permitting department tonight when the meeting's over. I know I am. So thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you very John. much for having me. Oh, thank you for doing this. And thank you, John, for sharing with us. Madam Mayor, you're and, welcome. You and for your report too, you know, oh, and the report too. Yeah, the picture takes the cake though. Oh, it's beautiful. The, the painting, the work of art, I should say. Yeah, it really is. So thank you. And thank you for doing such a great job. Thank you, okay. good night. Okay. So we are on to public comments. So Madam City Clerk, I know we have some. How many do we have? Um, on non-agendized items, um, I have roughly 14, 15 of them. Okay, so let's go ahead 
with those and we'll see um, if we can get them. We've got 30 minutes for those and I, I don't really want to hold any over so I think we could probably get them all in in 30 minutes. So um, let me go ahead and read. A total of 30 minutes is provided for members of the public to address the city council on items that appear on the consent calendar or a matter not listed on the agenda. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. For all public hearing or business items on the agenda, each speaker is limited to five minutes. For this meeting, public comments may be submitted and read into the record pursuant to the important notice provided at the top of this agenda. So, um, Madam City Clerk, would you please read the public comments? Yes. Uh, the first public comment um, does not have a name. It reads, this is a general comment for the City Council meeting. The Brown Act says, General comments are allowed to be sent anonymously. Prevent communist insurgency in our city. There are widespread efforts in our country to institute so-called race equity diversity programs. These programs are, com are composed of communists trying to get administrative powers in local governments. They pretend to be stopping racism. Racism is already against the law. If someone is discriminated against, they can file a complaint. These racial equity and diversity programs are anti-American. They want to take away our freedom of speech for starters, then tell organizers, organizations who they can and cannot employ. They also promote diversity training, which is plainly re-education and indoctrination. These programs will keep getting bigger until, the do until they dominate the entire government. Collectives think big government will lead to utopia. It never works that way. Don't let these groups have any influence in our city. They always stir up conflict. This race baiting, race baiting tactic is a communist strategy to sow division and eventually dominate the local government. They use intimidation to force people to take it. They don't allow any diversity of opinion. It is your duty to defend our constitutional rights. Look how communism ends up in other countries like China. They are slaves. Defend our rights of free speech and actions. Keep communist racial equity programs away from our city. The next speaker is Jason Lund. I'm asking the city council for a full and complete accounting of the $14 million being received in lieu of opening up the city for commerce and growth so desperately needed. The COVID CARES Act funds are meant to offset loss, not buffer current city expenses in lieu of the tax license and other miscellaneous revenue the city would otherwise receive were the council to act in the best interest of their constituents and halt the political posturing. Therefore, there must be a full and complete forensic accounting of the funds disbursement and allocation. This will ensure no nepotism, side and backroom deals or other course of play will occur with the funds. It appears reasonable that the council would also want such an open book follow through to show the voters there's no profit or gain being made by any council member, family member or associated business partners. If you are shutting us down, then show us where you are spending the money being set to support us or remove all restrictions, allow us to go about our lives and the revenue will come to you in that manner. The next speaker is Bob Cow. In my house, we believe God made science. Fauci said unintended consequences of masks, saying people keep fiddling with the mask and they keep touching their face. He said masks are not needed. All lives matter as we all humans are created in the image of God. There are only two genders. Equality of being human is real. Equity of human outcomes is fake social science. Women's and men's right need to be respected. So don't cheat in sports by being a man in a woman's sport or in elections just to win, win fairly. My house has walls. People that want to come to my house need to be invited. Otherwise they would be illegally in my house. Countries borders as well as fences around the capital are the same as walls around a house to keep people from illegally entering. Disabilities such as not being able to wear a mask are respected. Always be loving and kind. Don't hate people for supporting Trump and stop state-sponsored terrorism on our streets by BLM and Antifa. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Treat others fairly. Respect others that are, in, that are better in something than you are. Respect others that aren't as good as you in some things. Respect that the results of outcome are not equal. And finally, PJ Pack, I have your number. The next speaker is Jeff Pack. Good evening, City Council, and thank you, Mayor, for reading my letter tonight. Having spent the better part of two decades as a journalist in and around this region and a cumulative 15 years as a Temecula resident, I'm saddened to see the turmoil and disruption caused by a rogue council member attempting to push partisan politics onto the council. Since she arrived on the local political scene, Mrs. Alexander has done little to impress me. Pushed forward by outgoing council member Mike Nagar, Alexander took tens of thousands of dollars from the Riverside County Sheriff's Association and produced mailers and documentation, which in my opinion, 
was designed to slander her opponent. Having seen the darkened photos of her opponent and including national politics level ideologies in her mailers, I could see exactly what kind of quote unquote leader she would be if elected. Well, it took only five months for her true colors to be shown. She reportedly skipped a racial equity training workshop and within weeks of that put her uneducated privilege on full display, this time for the nation to scowl upon. I, for one, care little about how Mrs. Alexander feels when asked to wear a mask to protect herself and others. When she is around those who will permit it, she may, as, she may do as she likes. But when people I like and respect are unwittingly subjected to whichever and whatever illnesses she may or may not have simply because she's foolishly attempting to toe the party line, it must be singled out. Maybe she missed that workshop as well, the one where political partisanship has no place on a local city council. Her refusal to apologize for making a false claim of victimhood and equating herself to a real actual civil rights hero. Well, that takes the cake. Clearly she lacks the discipline, judgment and focus it takes to do the job at hand, doing her duty for the residents of her district and all the citizens of Temecula, not the Republican party, not the defeated and disgraced DJT and not for her own personal belief system. It has been said that true leaders <laughs> It, is, it has been said that true leaders act with integrity and in doing so they establish trust. Ms. Alexander has shown and earned neither. The next speaker is Suzanne Lane. I noticed in the last meeting that Mariana Edwards stated that Temecula has never had a mask mandate. Please stop requiring mask and temperature checks for entry into city public buildings such as city hall, public libraries, etc. Mask and temperature checks are medical interventions and should absolutely be voluntary. We do not consent and will not comply. And it is unconstitutional and a violation against California Penal Code 51B, which is an actual law on the books protecting our civil rights. Also, please explain exactly what Aaron Adams is doing with the $14 million the city received for the COVID CARES Act money. Every dollar is to be accounted for, including vendors and outside contractors. We want full transparency. The next speaker is Gary Nelson. This one's a little lengthy, so. Last year, Councilman Stu was pressured to resign over a text message response that some deem racist. Who asked him to resign? I have 100% absolute proof that the majority of citizens in his district did not ask him to resign because they responded to his resignation by voting him right back into office. So if the citizens did not ask him to resign, then who did? Those people should be held accountable because they misrepresented the community. Stu made a mistake by resigning and the subsequent vote proved that. I am not saying his response to the question was appropriate or inappropriate. I am just saying his resignation was uncalled for, not appreciated by our community, and we had to vote again to make things right. Less than one year later, some are making the exact same mistake and calling for Mrs. Alexander to resign. Who are you to speak for the residents in her district? Her district just spoke and overwhelmingly appointed her to council. Elections are the backbone of democracy. She was voted in by the people in our community. If you don't like the people's decision, then campaign against her next election, but don't try and pressure her to resign. From what I can tell, Mrs. Alexander is a God-fearing woman who fears God more than she does man, the virus, or Sacramento. And the citizens in her district overwhelmingly feel the same way, which is why they voted for her. Temecula is not Sacramento. We as a community worship our Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ, and no one else. And if you don't believe that's true, then I dare you to campaign on the fact that you don't worship Jesus and see how many votes that gets you. You already know that would be political suicide in this town. I remind you, we have a Bible teaching church on every corner. We love and respect our police. We uphold biblical principles regarding all parts of life. Our county sheriff is an outspoken believer in Jesus Christ and supports liberty, justice, freedom, and the constitution. And our district attorney is similar. We love God, we love democracy, we love fairness. So if you as a councilman is, are not representing those things, then you are not representing your community and you need to state such so we can vote you out. I literally saw the councilwoman who represents my district turn off her computer while Mrs. Alexander was explaining to the other members that she felt like she was being discriminated against. Are you kidding me? You represent me, my family, my district, and thousands of us in Temecula, and you think it's acceptable to walk out of a meeting. If you choose not to stay for the entire meeting, then we will get someone in there who will. 
In the meantime, I volunteer myself to attend the meeting on behalf of my district when you choose to walk away. And if this childish behavior continues, then the voters will speak loudly at the polls at the next election. Now to Mrs. Alexander's comments. Rosa Park was discriminated against because of the color of her skin. It's absolutely disgusting to discriminate against someone based on skin color, gender, nationality, vaccine status, mask wearing, sexual preference, or religious beliefs. Having someone sit in the back of the bus or in a different part of the room because of any of the items I just mentioned is unacceptable. Just, that's three minutes, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Sonia Perez and the exact same identical comment was also submitted by Aurelia Brower. Temecula City Hall building belongs to we the people and 14 months is way too long to be closed to the public for in-person city council meetings. In addition, the building is requiring unconstitutional procedures by requiring the public to wear muzzles and have their temperatures taken. Let it be known that the council was elected to represent the hardworking people of the city and for the past 14 months has been self-serving. Each council member that has voted to keep us locked down at any percentage has blood on their hands. Any suicides, elderly loss from lack of touch and visits by their family members and or business closures and revenue losses are directly tied to your votes the entire 14 months. You are all on notice that you have violated your oath of office and will be held accountable. Uh, again, that was Sonia Perez and also verbatim um, Aurelia Brauer. The next speaker is Candace Keller. Well, it looks like our newly woke city council is now being controlled by the local Temecula Unity hate group. This extreme progressive hate group will not stop until they see our great sheriff Bianco gone. The majority of our conservative city will not stand for this. I look forward to seeing most of you being challenged in your upcoming re-election bids. No wonder Mike Nagar got off the council. He saw all of this coming. Not all of us want to see our beautiful community turn into the next liberal cesspool. Hashtag weak leadership. The next speaker is John Andrews, and it's a little lengthy, so we'll start the timer. Daniel Horowitz has it right. She said that there is not a place on earth where masks appear even to have slowed the spread of the virus, which appears hell bent on cutting through every population until the herd immunity threshold is met. None of this should have surprised us. How many people do you know who always wear their masks fully clamped to their faces like a respirator? Well, there are a few people who can afford to pass out after hours of oxygen deprivation. That in a nutshell is why mask mandates are useless against a virus. Even before we examine the fact that the pores in the mask fibers are much larger than the virus itself. Stephen Petty, one of the most experienced certified industrial hygienists and exposure experts in the country sent me the following chart based on new research on mask filtration, Drunik et al. It demonstrates that if just 3.2% of the mask face is open, the efficacy of the mask goes down to zero. As you can see with just 2% of the mask area open, 80% of the particles under 2.5 microns will escape. Based on that study, Petty extrapolates that the mask will be 100% ineffective in blocking any particles that small, that small when the open area reaches uh, 3.2%. What people forget is that aside from the size of the pores in the fabric, very few people actually wear masks the way they test them in the labs or on mannequins. As Petty points out, based on a new study of filtration, leakage in masks from 44 different materials, most of the seepage comes out through the sides because the molecules always travel the path of least resistance. Measurements with defined leaks showed that already a small fractional leak area of 1 to 2 percent can strongly deteriorate total FE, concluded the German study published last October in Aerosol Science and Technology. This is especially the case for particles smaller than 5 millimeters diameter, where FE dropped by 50 percent or even two-thirds. The study goes on to explain that because surgical masks as well as cloth masks never have a perfect fit on the face, it is one of the main reasons why in studies investigating filter efficiencies of masks under real life conditions for surgical masks, the efficacy is slightly lower than what we see with form-fitted N95s. It's also likely the reason why filtration studies in the lab show some degree of efficacy, but not a single randomized 
controlled trial, RCT, has demonstrated efficacy of these masks against viruses, including 10 RCTs of the flu and mask wearing, as well as the Danish study of mask use for COVID. Humans are not lab mannequins, as Megan Mansell, a hazardous environs PPE expert, explained to me. This is what everyone got wrong from day one, or perhaps what Fauci and others originally got right. The COVID conversation should have begun with minimum viable particle size under pressure, which for COVID size particulates is 0 0.06 microns. Madam Mayor, that's three minutes. Okay. The next speaker is Tim Thompson. I am Pastor Tim Thompson and I am a spiritual leader to many people in your city. As a spiritual leader, I wanted you to consider the following. In Leviticus 13, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when a man has on the skin of his body, a swelling, a scab or a bright spot, and it becomes on the skin of his body like a leprous sore, then he shall be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons, the priest. Priests in ancient Israel were responsible for all manners of things, but they were not physicians. That was a separate role in society. In addition to their many responsibilities, the priests were tasked with determining whether a type of a sore on the skin was leprous or not. Leviticus 13 goes on to say that the priest shall examine the sore on the skin of the body. And if the bright spot is white on the skin of his body and does not appear to be deeper than skin and its hair has not turned white, then the priest shall isolate the one, emphasis added, who has the sore seven days. Please understand that God gives very specific instruction here. We are to isolate the one who's sick. Can you see how as a world, what we've done is we've rejected God on every level. We've rejected him on marriage, on sexuality, and on gender. We've rejected him as the creator. The list goes on. Now we're rejecting him on what you do in a community if a person gets sick. God's instructions are to isolate that person. We are not supposed to isolate everyone else. The sick person got isolated and it was business as usual for everyone else. Can you see how you as the city council by being complicit in the shadow in the showdown measures are placing true Bible believing Christians in a situation where they are faced with a choice. Either follow these rules which go against God's common sense instruction or violate the draconian measures being implemented. God's word goes on to say that the leper on whom the sore is his clothes shall be torn and his head bare and he shall cover his mustache and cry unclean unclean. Did you get that? He will cover his mustache. In other words, he will cover his face. The one who is sick covers their face, not the ones who aren't sick. This is biblical. Again, I bring to your attention your continued enforcement of the shutdown and masking rule violates all common sense and violates God's instruction. I know some of you on the council claim to be Christian. I urge you to stop enforcing any of these idiotic rules and lead by example. Take off your mask, stop social distancing, and stop prostituting our city for money from the state. Start giving out hugs, literal physical hugs. The people in your city need it. People like me are sick of being discriminated against for our deeply held religious beliefs. We do not want to be forced to comply with something that goes against our faith. You are not supposed to allow us to be discriminated against, and yet you seem complicit in the discrimination. Open the chambers. What, why are you still on Zoom? Why have I witnessed Marianne Edwards go off camera for extended periods of time during public comments directed at Jessica Alexander? Please take off your masks and restore the community's faith in our city council. Stop discriminating against us for not wearing masks. The next speaker is Nikki Thompson. My name is Nikki Thompson and I minister to many women in your city. You need to know something about my deeply held religious beliefs. If I determine that anything has a connection to the occult or anything wicked, I am to abstain from it. I am to avoid even the appearance of evil. I don't want anyone to even think I may be complicit in it. That being said, there are several methods the occult uses to ritually initiate people, some unwittingly, Four of their methods are being used on the American people. The ritual of mask wearing, the ritual of washing hands, the ritual of social distancing associated with circles and the number six, and the ritual of social isolation with token gifts. Members of the cult have long worn masks as part of their rituals. The wearing of masks is a form of alchemy, the conversation of one thing into another. We see this during Halloween. Children put on a mask of their favorite superhero and voila, they become that character. 
The wearing of the mask is also a tool of oppression. You and I were created in the image of a loving, all-powerful God. Satan hates this fact and desires to cover that image. Don't believe me? Ask any woman in Saudi Arabia. Masks represent compliance and submission to the leaders of the cult who love making people wear them and love it even more when people comply. Please stop trying to make the citizens of Temecula comply with mask wearing. You are discriminating against our deeply held religious beliefs. In the occult, hand washing is the ritualistic symbol of rejection. The washing of hands dates all the way back to Pontius Pilate washing his hands of Christ. The person involved even unwittingly is symbolically washing away their old way of life and accepting the new way. Social distancing associated with circles and the number six is a hallmark of the occult. You've seen this, you've seen this in movies and documentaries. They place the person who is being ritually initiated into the occult or a person being offered as a sacrifice in the center of a circle. Around that person, they place candles or other people in the form of a circle six feet from the person in the center. Please stop trying to make the citizens of Temecula comply with social distancing. You are discriminating against our deeply held religious beliefs. Social isolation, AKA quarantining with token gifts is another ritual they use to initiate someone. They give the person something so that person doesn't feel so bad about being isolated. In other words, we're going to quarantine you, but we're going to give you a $1,200 stimulus check, so don't feel so bad about it. Why is the city council awaiting $14 million from the state? Why are you prostituting our city and not caring about the business, about the businesses and people's lives? Please stop trying to make citizens of Temecula comply with quarantining the healthy. You are discriminating against our deeply held religious beliefs. All four of these things were implemented at the onset of the COVID-19 crisis. Madam Mayor, that's three minutes. Okay. Next speaker is PJ in Temecula. Are you not entertained, District 2? Is this not what you voted for? Temecula, is this what you expected from your city council members? Making national and international news, mocking the city for behavior of one radical council member. This is why elections matter. This is why sheriff's association is throwing money at a candidate simply because she's white without having any insight into the way she would drag the reputation of the city through the mud. And then we have sheeples appearing on regional television, uh, one who claimed to be a Temecula resident, but is not, and another fellow on the boob tube yelp yelping about civil rights violations, privilege pensions, white guys have had enough. This is what you voted for. This is who we are now to the rest of the world. You thought that then you thought then you thought Mayor, Mayor Quitz was damaging. Then you thought Old Town open for business during the worldwide pandemic was dam damaging. Now we have Temecula Councilwoman being mocked by Stephen Colbert and that is damaging. Temecula, sadly, very sadly, at least on network and cable news stations has solidified itself as Florida of Southwest Riverside County. Hashtag Temecula, we're pretty much like Florida. Hashtag keep religion out of city government. Hashtag, I don't care what you quote unquote feel like you're wrong. Hashtag time to resign. The next speaker is Andrea Andrews. And then Madam Mayor have one more after that. Okay. Um, this one's lengthy, so we'll use the. According to America's frontline doctors, after several months dealing with capacity related issues in COVID-19 vaccine administration, U.S. states are set to find themselves with a supply of Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson immunizations, outstripping demand for the experimental shots. According to a recent report by the Kaiser Family Foundation, by about mid-May, states will reach a tipping point where demand for rather than supply of vaccines is our primary challenge. One official with the American Public Health Association put it this way, Anybody who's ever done a public health program knows that the last 20 to 30% of your target is the hardest. Perhaps anticipating the challenge, the Biden administration dedicated 48 billion in its stimulus legislation to implement a national evidence-based strategy for testing, contact tracing, surveillance, and mitigation with respect to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. By means of comparison, by means of comparison, the National Intelligence Program budget, which includes the CIA and parts of the FBI, will spend about $62 billion in the current year, just 29% more than a single COVID-related line item in the President's America Rescue Plan. 
On April 24th, state health authorities in Indiana, New York, Virginia, Miss Missouri and Michigan resumed administering Johnson & Johnson's COVID vaccine following an 11-day federal pause on the single-shot inoculation. According to published reports, a review by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention CDC Advisory Committee, known as ACIP, uncovered 15 cases of vaccine side effects involving potentially fatal blood clots. All were women, most under 50 years old. Three died and seven remain hospitalized. ACIP ultimately decided to lift the pause and recommend attaching a warning label to the experimental inju injection to which J&J's chief medical officer agreed to add a later date. The CDC's early warning system for vaccine side effects, its 30-year-old vaccine adverse, adverse event reporting system or VAERS has captured thousands of other adverse events since COVID-19 vaccination effort began in late 2020. Yet these complications have received a fraction of the attention paid to J&J's blood clotting, blood clotting controversy. Why America's frontline doctors opposes attempts by state and federal jurisdictions to mandate vaccination for COVID-19 and supports further study by independent health officials before the Food and Drug Administration replaces its conditional emergency use authorization for the immunizations with full approval, known as a biologic science, a decision license, a decision which could come as early as April or May, 2021. Madam Mayor, that's three minutes. Okay. The last comment is Skylar Temple. Good evening, council, staff, and residents. It is with Great frustration that I write once again to make clear to the council and to the public at large that council member Jessica Alexander is unfit to continue on the city council of our beautiful city. Since the last meeting, Mrs. Alexander has chosen to take down all public facing social media in lieu of actually communicating with her constituents. This came after she began blocking those same constituents and legal action was threatened. Mrs. Alexander refused to even recognize that the word she flippantly used to falsely equate the struggle of Rosa Parks to her own temper tantrum against public health were wrong. Mrs. Alexander continues to only serve herself on this council and not the people. If Ms. Alexander actually cared about the residents of Temecula, surely she would do the bare minimum, right? Of course, this rhetorical question assumes that she is capable of conversation with residents she might not agree with, or for that matter represents. This question assumes that she is capable of owning up to making inappropriate statements about a civil rights leader. Instead, Ms. Alexander chooses to headline a make-believe circus of white Christian oppression to distract her supporters from the fact that she not only does nothing for them, but is only in this for herself. By the way, as a white Christian myself, we are not oppressed. The only way you can feel oppressed as a white Christian is if you believe your ability to oppress others is a part of your identity. Oh, and let's not forget on top of all of this that I just wanted a meeting, a chance to speak with my representative about the issues near and dear to me and my family. Yet while her active choice to ignore one constituent may seem small, the active choice to turn her back on her entire district is a disgrace to Temecula. Shame on you, Jessica Alexander. I know many hope that you will do the right thing by apologizing, attending the ready training and begin meeting with your constituents, but I lost hope long ago for such an outcome. I'll remind the public once again that the racist name Jessica Alexander had no problem darkening the skin of her African-American opponent in mailers last fall. I'll remind the public that someone who received nearly $50,000 of support from the police union will never support police reform. The zealot sitting before you does not embody the values of Temecula. I pray for those still supporting Ms. Alexander to see the light of re reason. Christians are meant to be loving and accepting people who are commanded to love thy neighbors as you love yourself. Ms. Ms. Alexander preaches fear and intolerance, not love and acceptance. Once again, Jessica Alexander, it's time to resign. Madam Mayor, that is all of the um, public comments on non-agendized items. Okay, thank you. So next we have city council report. Um, you know, uh, if you'll, if you'll, enter, if you'll um, allow me to, I think I'm gonna take mayor's license and, and go first. And this is probably a good time after the comments that we've just heard. So I have lived in Temecula 32 years and most of 
Those 32 years were spent very happily working as a full-time volunteer um, for many nonprofit organizations, children, seniors, uh, you know, blood drives, the school district, my church, Rancho Community Church. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, at the urging of friends, I ran for public office. So I am so honored to serve in public office in Temecula. Um, you feel like you really have a chance to help uh, protect our quality of life and work with your neighbors and uh, fellow residents to make sure Temecula stays one of the best places to live in the country, as far as I'm concerned. And when I see a division like we have right now over something, really, when you think about it, I realize that the mask is a symbol for some, and it's a symbol of tyranny and what um, we fear in the end times that the government will try to do to its people. And I think from a practical standpoint, I understand that as a, as a Christian. And there are so many signs right now that would confer with what Revelation tells us. But as a public leader, someone who has taken an oath to uphold the laws of the state of California and the laws of the United States of America and the constitutions of both, I cannot intentionally ask anyone to violate the law. And the appellate courts just ruled that the governor's mandate is the final word on what can be done and what must be done during an emergency. Once a governor declares an emergency, really what they mandate afterwards is basically like the law. California has been wrong in so many things. The research and the, the medical research, uh, you know, has been conflicting, but I believe that children, uh, you know, are not susceptible to the virus. Um, I believe many of the things that, th that the research says that, that would confirm that we don't really need to wear masks and that masks can be more harmful than they can be good. But again, the oath that I took on behalf of the residents of this community, including those who agree with the fact that we should wear masks, uh, I have to honor that oath. I cannot allow my personal feelings to supersede the oath that I took and the mandate that I have as an elected official. And that's where we are today. The city of Temecula is not mandating that masks be worn. What the only, the only thing the city is doing right now is maintaining that in city hall itself. And that's why City Hall is not open. We're still um, obeying basically the law. And we will continue to do that because we are not only a lawmaking agency ourselves in the form of ordinances and the laws that we have in the city, um, you know, we are in most cases an enforcer. So that has been not the case where, where COVID is concerned because the, the state has been very unclear about how things were to be enforced. And the state has taken on the role of enforcer. The county is not an enforcer at this point either. So we have uh, opted to keep City Hall closed as part of um, obeying the law and the mandate. And I know I'm going to get emails that say that's not what the law or the mandate is. And then I'm going to get other emails that say that's exactly what the law and the mandate is. But I think what is most hurtful is to see a community that I've known and loved for 32 years so divided, uh, division between friends, between, division between family members, division between churches that, that cooperate uh, on other things in their outreach to uh, you know, humanity and to people in our community in need. And during this virus, there were a lot of people in need. Um, we cannot overlook the fact that we have more than 100 flags flying down at the duck pond in honor of those who died. And I'm not going to argue whether COVID was the actual cause of death or whether it wasn't the actual cause of death. But I know that those people died isolated, alone, without their family. And those families had to contend with the death of a loved one without being able to see them, hold them, uh, you know, say the final words, grieve. So, uh, you know, we've got grief on both sides, regardless of what was the ultimate cause of death. So I'm not going to argue whether it was COVID or whether it was pneumonia brought on by COVID or whether it was an underlying condition that was pre-existing. You know, 
we're talking about people who died alone and families who weren't able to comfort those their relatives and loved ones who died alone. So I think we're not focusing on what is correct. What is correct is that we are a community and we are trying to do the best we can to move forward at a time when every community in the country is divided. Um, and it's very sad. We're trying to work it out as best as we can. I would just ask that people don't automatically assume the worst about me and about members of the city council. We are human beings, just like you are, everyone else. We've been tasked with this tremendous honor and it is the most tremendous honor that I could ever have in a lifetime to be able to serve in the city that I've loved and my family has loved for 32 years. Um, there's nothing untoward going on here. Um, $14 million is what the city has spent to cover the costs that were as a result were, were necessary as a result of the COVID outbreak. More police and fire protection, more ambulance services. We help the uh, business owners in Old Town and other business owners in town stay in businesses with grants. I mean, I could just go on and on. And we have documented every penny of what has been spent on behalf of COVID and it has to be COVID related. So we have to make, you know, we have to make sure that that's documented and we have that. Right now, the federal government has not determined quite yet which of the things they're going to allow or how they're going to disperse the funds. So we are keeping records of the, and so far it's $14 million, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit less, maybe $200 less than that. It's not much. Uh, what the city has spent on what we believe to be COVID related. And um, as soon as the federal and state governments get their act together and, and decide how those monies will be dispersed, because we have complied with the governor's mandate, which was you know, in compliance with the federal law, um, we will be um, eligible to receive reimbursement for what we have spent on COVID. And I don't think we're prostituting ourselves to try and get money back when money is offered. We're not doing anything for that money other than complying with the governor's mandate, which is basically the law of the land right now. So when people say that you know we're crooks or we're doing things um, you know for ourselves, there are no kickbacks. There's no nothing associated with any of this just the best intentions of people who work hard and are honest um, on behalf of their city. And I love this city and I love my neighbors and I love my fellow residents. Um, you know, um, I've covered a lot of ground in 32 years through volunteering and schools and kids and, and you know, my wonderful marriage of almost 45 years, which I can't believe, you know, I'm that old. It's just been a wonderful life, and we want to make sure that that life continues for everyone. Everybody in this country is hurting right now. Everybody is particularly sensitive, and everybody has drawn lines in the sand when at a, at a time when we really need to come together and just get through it, and we're almost through it. I really believe that. Um, there's no guarantee that the governor won't say to continue wear masks, and we're going to have to see down the road what we do. Um, it can't go on forever. I hate wearing masks. I hate it when other people hate wearing masks. They're awful. They don't allow you to communicate. And for so many other reasons, I want to be face to face with um, our residents. And I'm upstairs in my office and three of us are up here and two of them are down in the chamber. And I don't like that either. These are my friends and my coworkers and my colleagues and I want it to be together. So I just wish all of the fighting and accusations could go away. Um, and just for everyone to know that we're doing the best we can. Temecula has come through COVID. We had budget review today um, amazingly well. We planned well, um, we protected the city and we've come through. Um, unemployment is very low, that's good. We're back down to amazing numbers for unemployment. Um, our budget looks great, uh, revenues look great. And the future is bright coming ahead. You've heard about all the projects that were accomplished during COVID. 
um, while City Hall was physically closed, it was virtually open. And apparently people love doing business virtually because we did more business than you know, we've done uh, you know, in, in a regular amount, a regular, uh, under regular conditions. So I just wish people wouldn't feel so divisive about things that in the, in the large scheme of things, for those who think that, you know, it's tyranny, I think it's temporary. And there are a lot of things that I would consider to be tyranny. We have so many restrictions and so many laws and, and things that we have to obey and things that prevent us from doing things that we'd like to do. Um, this is just one of those things. People are just tired of the masks and I'm tired of them too. So I just ask that, you know, speak your mind. I don't mind hearing people's opinions. I love pe hearing people's opinions and I love open discussion without hostility so that I find it fascinating what other people think. And I very oftentimes, you know, will change my mind based on information I receive from other people. And I just think that's what happens when communication uh, takes place in a calm and peaceful and understanding environment, but we don't have that right now. So I would just ask people, try and put yourself in other people's shoes. Um, you know, and again, I'll say it starts with me. And through this whole thing, I think that I continue to be gracious and loving to all my council members without question. And I think if you'd ask them, I think that that's what they would say. I've tried to be fair. Um, and I try to be very fair in complimenting our staff. They've done a fantastic job in the most horrendous time, I can say in probably in, in our you know living memories. Um, and again, we've come through it. Now Temecula, my fellow residents have to come through it too and realize when this is all over, we're all still gonna be living in the same great city. And I want everyone to feel like they can get along and get back to what is normal. And that is, uh, you know, being great in Temecula. Temecula is a very welcoming, warming, loving and caring place. And um, I just want that to return to us. And again, it starts with me, it starts with you one person at a time. So I know I've taken a long time, but I just wanted to tell you that, um, you know, we're doing the best we can. We are obeying the state mandate or law so that taxpayers, you, we can get your money back. It's $14 million of taxpayer money. It's all accounted for, and we're just waiting to see um, how they're going to disperse funds and if they're going to disperse funds. I don't really believe anything when the federal or the state government is concerned these days, but that's what we hope for. So that's what we're keeping track for. Um, thanks for allowing me to kind of just um, air my heart. And uh, I love my fellow uh, council members. I think they all work very hard. And we're up here. And when we fail, we fail in living color on TV and on the front page of the paper. And, uh, you know, we have to have a degree of forgiveness um, for everyone. If somebody, you know, takes a wrong step, makes a mistake, uh, says something in the spur of the moment, there's a lot of pressure and you have to speak and you're live on television. So um, I have that grace that I give that forgiveness to, to myself and to my colleagues. And I hope that um, you'd find it in your hearts to do the same for us. Uh, we're doing the best we can and we think we're doing what's best for Temecula. So I'm going to stop there um, and say, is there anybody else that would like to speak? So please do. Nobody? Nobody? Matt? All right. Uh, well, that, that's a lot of uh, information so far this evening. Um, I do have a couple, <laughs> a couple things to, to say. That's first, a lot. Right? Just been a couple meetings just like this. Um, <clears throat> let me start by uh, just correcting one thing I heard earlier this evening. City Hall is open, right? We are absolutely 100% open. Um, the council did vote to maintain virtual meetings until at least uh, June 15th, where we will uh, revisit that, um, that process. But we are still meeting and everyone still has access and has a voice. Um, but rest assured, City Hall is still working. And by all metrics, City Hall is working now harder than we did before the pandemic. Second, I'd ask real quick if the city manager 
can please clear up exactly what that $14 million is, is all about. We need to get this one 100% correct. There's, there's no room for, for mistakes here. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Just, just to clarify a few points the mayor was making and um, is the city is not in receipt of $14 million. No. The city has not spent $14 million, okay? Um, we anticipate like every other city in the United States of America under the federal program, <clears throat> you will be the recipient of uh, federal funds that are designed to be used to replenish the loss of revenue as it relates to the COVID and the global pandemic. Uh, the US Department of Treasury this week came out with 155 pages of instruction related to this national federal program. Okay, that just came out yesterday. Staff is looking that over. It's not built into our budget. It's not built into our capital budget. It'll be uh, something that we'll need to understand what's eligible, what's not eligible. And we'll be coming back to the city council probably later this summer. And we'll be discussing the appropriate and recommended usage of that 14 million. By the way, that 14 million will be spread over two fiscal years. So it'll be $7 million in the upcoming fiscal year. It'll be $7 million in the year following. So again, we haven't received 14 million. Mayor <coughs> Adams, city manager, has not spent $14 million. There will be a very public process associated with prioritizing what that's used for, what it's eligible for. What the city has received and did receive last fall was 1.3 million of CARES Act money. And I think some folks are confusing the two. We got that 1.3 million one-time money, one-time grant, and we appropriately uh, used that uh, for COVID-related expenses, primarily uh, for fire services. We reported it to the federal government. It's all available if somebody wants to monitor that, audit it, or see that. Uh, the city finance department followed all the necessary procedures for those federal dollars. So. Happy to answer any more questions, you know, that you may have, but um, there lies the uh, the truth, I guess, about the 14 million. Well, I, I, I wasn't lying though, you know, about the 14 million because the city has lost that revenue, yet we've continued to have, we continue to have to support, uh, you know, city processes. So I guess, um, you know, I didn't explain it as well as I could, but I don't want to do anything to jeopardize us yeah. receiving that 14 million or, um, you know, to change our eligibility for that 14 million. Madam Mayor, let, let me just remind the council that you can make uh, comments in response to the comments that were made by the public and you can answer questions, but you can't discuss it among yourselves as to what you may wanna do. As uh, uh, city manager, Aaron Adams indicated, this will be a public process that will be coming through in the next uh, couple of months and all of the money that can be spent, all of the reimbursements that's available will be front and center in one of your public meetings for you to discuss. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Peter, thank you. Aaron, thank you. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the clarity on that. Uh, now, now, continuing real quick, I just want to make a couple comments on uh, our communications and social media policies for city and city council. Um, as you recall, hopefully, part of what we decided last year is that the council would be provided with additional training regarding communications, media relations, and other uh, types of uh, uh, public forms of communication, and go through a process to, to have us establish some, some standards, some policies uh, along with that. Now, I've made it abundantly clear that I firmly believe that what we say as an elected official is extremely consequential to you know, our neighbors, the residents, the businesses, um, and that requires us to have a high level of care and prudence. We don't always get it right. Um, Mary Ann, you said it earlier, this is a very public stage and sometimes, you know, things don't, uh, don't come out the way we would want to, but it should certainly be our aim to do so, right? And to make sure we do get it right. Uh, I also recognize that freedom of speech is paramount. I strongly support everyone's right to express themselves as they see fit. Uh, but that right is not absolute, and it's certainly not without consequence. Serving in this position is a solemn responsibility that I think we all need to take very seriously. How we present ourselves reflects directly on our city, our residents, and even our local economy. It can have very positive 
benefits and, and impacts, but it can also have very negative uh, ramifications as well. So what I'm saying here is I'd like to make sure that as we revisit the subsequent phases of the efforts related to READY and other things that we discussed and enacted last year, I wanna make sure that we revisit the development and adoption of council policy that creates clear expectations of how we communicate with one another, the city manager, executive directors and staff, along with our engagement in social media, the public, the press, et cetera. A lot of cities do this. This isn't uncommon. There's a lot of boilerplate, and a lot of great information out there that basically just sets the expectations of, of, of how we all should, should treat each other and how we should all talk to one another. Um, like I mentioned, it's our responsibility, and Marianne, you said this earlier, to uphold the Constitution of the United States and that of the state of California. It also means that if we engage in an active presence on social media, uh, where we're, we're representing the city of Temecula, that we uphold everyone right to free expression, whether or not they agree with us, whether or not they're challenging our personal beliefs or opinions or positions on city managers, stifling those voices is the antithesis of what we as their representatives should be doing as an open and transparent government. And the courts have spoken uh, very clearly about this issue. While what we refer to as the offensive language principle can be used as justification of speech limitations, the actual practice of restricting forms of expression that we as an individual may seem uh, uh, to be offended by um, or to society in general, this practice is not easy, right? The courts have been pretty clear that this threshold is very high, giving considerable deference to protecting speech rather than limiting it. Blocking people on social media accounts because we disagree with them or are offended by their language is problematic, problematic at best and a violation of the First Amendment at worst. Okay. Um, our own city attorney has been very uh, helpful and supportive in helping us navigate these issues. And I look to him, our city manager and the city clerk to assist us in the development of this council policy going forward. I'm confident that together we can put together a policy that addresses uh, concerns about external communications, creates expectations of integrity and professionalism, and respects the rights of everybody on the council and those of the public. Uh, now, a minute ago, I mentioned that with free speech, there's this concept of, you know, the offensive language principle. Uh, it's often discussed when talking about the First Amendment. Um, and I said in our last meeting, and I'll say it again, words matter. Right, right. We recognize that inflicting a physical harm to somebody is wrong, but words can have similar consequences, intentional or unintentional. Creating expectations or standards of our conduct as council members, as representatives of our city, really means uh, uh, that it's not just important for us, but it's important for our businesses, our visitors, everybody that comes and, and participates in Temecula. Uh, to understand you know, what, what we do as a city council and how we represent ourselves and our community. Uh, we're a friendly community. We're a very caring community. And we're a community that has had a longstanding tradition within this city council to represent everyone fairly, always work to find a balance in our deliberations and decisions and respect the decisions of our colleagues even when we might be on the trailing side of a vote. Now, if you've lived here more, for more than a couple of years, you would recognize that that's who we are as a city. Without that system in place, all of this just doesn't work. And so when I talk about creating these policies and what we said we were doing last year, I'd like to make sure that this is also related to our internal communications and how we agree or communicate with one another. We have to confer respect and professionalism in all of our dialogue. This is significant. It fosters a collegial environment and demonstrates that even under the most difficult conversations and circumstances, we still are talking to one another with respect and integrity. Offensive language and the manner in which it's expressed, the intentions or motivations of the speaker, the circumstances of how that speech takes place can all combine together to create offensive or insensitive language, intentional or not, right? That's sort of the, the recipe for that. Uh, hopefully we can all agree that this isn't how the city council should ever operate. But I have to say shortly after our last marathon meeting where we literally had hours of public comment focused mostly on speech and language, Ms. Alexander, you sent an email to the mayor and the city manager with the following on May 4th. 
saying, Mayor Edwards, during our last meeting, you stated that we are not opening chambers due to the possibility that we may not receive the $14 million from the China Virus Relief Fund. Even folks this evening in public comment refrained from using the term China Virus Relief Fund. It's sadly coincidental that we issued a proclamation here tonight, the first one we've ever done in the city of Temecula, recognizing National Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. I'm proud to see that we issued this proclamation for the very first time and proud of our local college for their leadership in this issue. But this is exactly why this is important, to recognize that everyone in our community is important and respected. Ms. Alexander, the language you used is insensitive. You have to know this. And you shouldn't have to ask me to explain why in my own background and experiences that this statement is exceptionally offensive. But if you want to, give me a call and I'll explain why. But you should know that this surprisingly thoughtless comment is now recorded in an official city communication. I mean, come on folks, we simply need to do better than this and demonstrate respect to the solemn role in which we have been elected. One of the other factors related to this offensive language principle is simply the ease of which that language could have been avoided. This was pretty easy. China and COVID both have five letters. They both start with the letter C. You could have chosen the less offensive option. I'm not here to puzzle out why you chose that specific speech or why you chose to address the mayor and the city manager that way. Um, but I have to mention that this really, we have to do better than this. This is why I request the support of my colleagues in making sure that as we move forward, we create a very clear, very transparent policy in attempt for all of us to take a more positive step together toward improving our ability to positively represent our community, our constituents, this beautiful city that we all love. And while I believe that this dialogue is important and I know for sure that this is going to help out the community in the long run. Candidly, we have other work that we need to do, right? So can we please stop with the antagonistic, destructive and negative dialogue? You know, I implore you all, let's get back to work because our city, our residents, our businesses, they're counting on us, on us to do just that. Uh, so that's all I have to say this evening. Thank you, Matt. Anyone else? Okay, so then we can move on to the consent calendar. Mayor. Ma'am. Yes, I would like to speak since I'm sure. Oh, I didn't see, where are you? There you are. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead, sorry. That's okay. So a lot of things have gotten spoken over the last couple months, well, last month and a half, I would say. And um, First off, I don't know how many people truly know me on this council or in Temecula, but the people who do know me, first of all, know my background. How many people have really taken the time to get to know me and my background truly? That I've lived overseas for over five years in different countries. That I've been to different 18, I've, I've visited over 18 different, or I've lived in five countries and I've visited 18. And I've loved every one. So nobody can tell me and sit here and tell me that I'm gonna race this person. Because of what I do, I love working with the community, with all people. And it breaks my heart to sit here and have people tell me that I'm racist because of what's in my heart. You know, first off, I wanna say I'm a Christian. Just like you, Mayor Marianne Edwards, I am a Christian. And the first thing I stand on is God. I'm a God-fearing woman, and somebody had mentioned that, and that is, that is the truth. My family comes next, and my country is the following. And having been in the military and in the police department, I have stood on that for decades. So it kills me to hear that somebody wants to tell me that I'm a racist individual because I, I love the people that I serve, and that is all people. This division is killing me as well but I feel that I need to be the, the, the voice for the individuals. Let's go back to the masks. Nobody wants to talk about it, but I'm gonna be honest what people aren't seeing. People are getting screamed at, yelled at. People are getting denied service like bathrooms. 
I have, I have people that I know that have to utilize the bathroom and can't even go in because they have a medical exemption and they're denied the ability to use a bathroom, a public restroom. People are getting physically harmed. I don't know how many people know about situations. There's been two situations that I know here in Temecula where people have been physically injured. Is anybody speaking about that? Or are we just gonna ignore it? Because I'm here to be that voice. My heart is beating so bad because it hurts me so bad that people are getting injured, both med med medically and physically. I can't even explain it if you're not seeing it. I want to be the voice of the people. People ask me to be their representative, and that's exactly what I'm doing. But God comes first, family comes next, and next to Mecula in my country. That's all I'm asking. And Matt, Ron, with all due respect, I would have so appreciated if you would have come to me directly with that, if you had a problem instead of announcing it, but that's okay. I thought we were colleagues. If there's a problem, we come to each other first. That's how we work together. That's how we build a, a relationship with one another. But you never came to me with that. You've never called me in the last month and a half to see how I was doing. You never asked me any of that. So next time you have something to say, I ask that you come to me first with all respect. And I will listen and I will be here to love everyone because that's my job here is to love and to show love. And I feel like that's exactly what I've done. So if somebody's not seeing that, well, I'm sorry. Maybe call me and let's have coffee because I absolutely will. Everybody knows the number here to city council and they can get a hold of me very easily. Thank you. Anyone else? Nope. Okay. I'm sorry, Jessica. I didn't, you're up in my corner and I didn't look up in the right corner. So thank you for speaking up so I could have you speak. Okay. We're going to move on to the consent calendar. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and all will be enacted by one roll call vote. There will be no discussion of these items unless members of the city council request specific items be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Waive reading of standard ordinance and resolutions, number one. Number two, approve action minutes. Number three, approve list of demands. Number four, adopt resolution regarding the California Climate Investment Fire Prevention Grant Program at the request of Mayor Pro Tem Ron. Number five, approve agreement with Western Audiovisual for the replacement of conference room audiovisual equipment. Number six, receive and file temporary street closures for the 2021 summer event. Number seven, amend the capital improvement program CIP for fiscal year 2021 through 2025 to add the Mary Phillips Senior Center Emergency Generator Project. Number eight, approve specifications and authorize solicitation of construction bids for citywide slurry seal program fiscal year 2020. 2021. Number nine, approve cooperative agreement with the City of Marietta for French Valley Parkway I-15 improvements phase two, PWS 16-01. Number 10, approve second amendment to the funding agreement with Riverside County Flood Control and Water Conservation District for cleanup of trash debris and other items on district owned property. And that's the final one. Do we have any abstentions from anybody? Is everybody up for voting? Okay, so in that case, I'll take a motion and a second. So move consent. Okay. Second. Okay, so I've got a motion and a second. Um, Madam City Clerk, could we have the roll call, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Mayor Edwards? Aye. Councilmember Ron? Aye. Councilmember Stewart? Councilmember Schrank. Aye, aye. Yeah, we can't hear you. <laughs> Councilmember Schrank. Aye. All right, thank you. So right now I'm going to recess the city council meeting to the Temecula Community Services District, successor agency to the Temecula Redevelopment Agency, the Temecula Housing Authority, and or the Temecula Public Financing Authority. And take it away, Zach Schwank. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. I'm going to call tonight's uh, Temecula Community Services District meeting to order. Uh, Madam City Clerk, since we remain in this virtual setting, would you please take the roll? Yes. Director Alexander? Aye. Director Edwards? Aye. 
Director Ron? Here. Director Stewart? Here. And President Schwenk? And I'm here. Thank you very much for that. Do we have any public comments this evening? We do not have any public comments. Great. Thank you. I'll go ahead and dispense with the reading of those roles and we'll move on to our consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one roll call vote. There will be no discussion of these items unless members of the Temecula Community Services District request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Item number 11 is approved action minutes of April 27th, 2021. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion in a second. Would you please take the roll call vote? Yes, Director Alexander? Aye. Director Edwards? Aye. Director Ron? Aye. Director Stewart? Aye. President Schwenk? Aye. Thank you very much, then. That passes by zero. We'll go ahead and move on to CSD business. We have one item this evening. Um, item number 12 is consider update regarding summer events and limitations on events, including Memorial Day observance, concerts, movies in the park, Art and Street Painting Festival and the 4th of July festivities and provide general direction regard, um, excuse me, regarding the same. Um, you know, before we get into this item, I'm gonna hand it off to Director Hawkins, but I just wanted to sort of uh, lead, lead into this a little bit. And, and I know it's been a tough year for our, our, our CSD staff and, and I see Don on the call now and, and that special events team has worked really hard. And, and as we get this update and maybe we'll, we'll sort of, this will be maybe a reoccurring theme is, is let's focus on what we can do, uh, what we are doing um, and not so much on maybe what we aren't able to do right now, but hopefully we will be able to do in the future. Um, try to stay positive. I know this is a lot to digest going through the staff report. There's quite a lot of information in there. Um, so I'm looking forward to this report and I know my colleagues are as well. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you, Director Hawkins. Thank you, Mr. President, for that and board directors. Uh, before turning it over to Don for her report, I just wanted to briefly reflect on the past 12 to 14 months and how despite the challenges we've all faced, our main focus has been to safely find a way to yes and providing programs, events, and services to our residents, um, which is why we're really just especially happy to be here tonight and have the board hear our recommendations based upon what we know today and hear any feedback and or guidance again to safely find a way to that yes. And that concept of yes is critically important as many of the staff are not just community services professionals, but also residents as well and part of a very deserving Temecula community. I'm also reminded that over the past months, each of you have been supportive in focusing on what we could do through a combination of virtual hybrid and actual experiences, having attended the playground ribbon cuttings, the, the student art mural unveilings, creating short videos and recreation challenges and volunteering at our senior meal programs and, and just so much more. So I wanted to take the, the time uh, to publicly thank you because we certainly appreciate that. However, nothing speaks to a return to normalcy like a Temecula signature special event which our community services commissioners echoed last night in their support as well. And honestly, we've come a long way since this time last year. And I can't imagine having a similar discussion this time next year regarding any of our events. So with that, we've gone from saying, let's put on fantastic events to dontastic events due to the person who will walk you through what's being proposed and answer any questions you may have related to our plans. So DA. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President and members of the board. It's always nice to provide you an update on what's happening in the events world. As an event planner, this has not been an easy year. I've worked in this field for over 20 years and this has by far been the most unusual in my professional career. I truly do look forward to getting back to our signature events and seeing the community come together, making memories and continuing their tradition at events that I helped create, but that's enough about me. I know this past year events have looked different, but we sure did bring happiness and fun to our residents. Remember waving to everyone during Here Comes Santa visits and the awesome emails and social media comments from Get Aged? Well, good news, the fun's going to continue all summer long. So typically this time of year, we are up to our eyeballs in 4th of July planning. With the cancellation of the Washington DC National Independence Day Parade, Coachella Music Festival, 
and the daily parades and fireworks at Disneyland, our summer events will look a little bit different once again. The events team has been Zooming with our colleagues from neighboring cities and attending bi-weekly meetings with the League of California Cities so we can keep up to date on current state guidelines, share ideas, and feel confident we are protecting the city as we make event recommendations. Let me share what the events team has been planning. Next slide, please. Thank you. So these first two events are pre-June 15th and have been planned adhering to state and Cal OSHA guidelines. So Memorial Day Observance Concert. The Temecula Valley Symphony's winds, brass, and percussion will be performing an old-fashioned concert that will, that will be recorded and premiered on Facebook on Saturday, May 29th. Last year, a virtual concert had over 300 views. Art and Street Painting Festival, a hybrid event. The annual Art and Street Painting Festival will be held June 1st through the 6th. 15 chalk artists will be creating their pavement masterpieces in person around the Main Street Y from June 4th through 6th while art exhibitors can register to be featured on our online marketplace with links to purchase directly from the artists. Last year, we also hosted an online marketplace and received very positive feedback from our exhibitors. Next slide, thank you. Summer concert series and movies in the park will be transition events from pre-June 15th events and then continuing throughout the summer. They have been planned to adhere to current state guidelines and we are ready to we are ready to transition post June 15th as we anticipate new guidelines will be coming. So first up, summer concert series. Get ready to rock and roll as concerts return live at the Temecula Amphitheater. Staff has created socially distanced pods throughout the amphitheater to host 167 spectators on Thursday nights. The reduced audience reflects current state guidelines which limit attendance to 33% of the venue's total capacity. As mentioned, we are ready to increase attendance as we get approval to do so. All concerts will be filmed and premiered on Facebook the following Tuesday for those who can't attend in person. Last year, our summer concerts averaged over 1,000 views per concert. We are proposing an expanded concert series from 7 to 11 this year as audience space will be limited. Movies in the Park. We're gonna turn that amphitheater into our summer movie theater. We'll be featuring movies in June and July this year. Groups of up to eight can reserve their socially distanced pod for a movie under the stars. Each movie night would also feature games and a craft to go along with the movie. Movie recommendations and craft tutorials will be available on Facebook for those looking to host a movie night at home. Thank you. Fourth of July. With the popularity of the 4th of July, crowds typically exceeding 6,000 in close proximity at an open venue like a parade route, there unfortunately is not a way to limit attendance and safely host a parade this year. But unlike last year, this year the fireworks show at the Ronald Reagan Sports Park can be launched as usual at 9 p.m. with our musical simulcast on KATY 101.3. With crowds of 25,000 plus, and with our current understanding of state guidelines, we will not be planning the day-long park entertainment and logistical support this year. Unfortunately, the park does not lend itself to drive-in fireworks as the majority of the parking spaces have obstructive viewing due to trees. I have consulted with fire personnel about other possible launch sites. There are three sites that, we, that would be permitted, Papert Soul Sports Park, Chaparral High School, and Ronald Reagan Sports Park. Ronald Reagan's more central location has the benefit of allowing the most residents to enjoy the show rather than launching from the north or south ends of town. We encourage residents to head to their neighborhood parks to enjoy the show and good news, there won't hardly be any traffic when you leave. Next slide, please. We do see movement in the events world and that is welcome news for event planners as we try to navigate the new normal for our large scale signature special events. Our goal has been the same throughout. Be thoughtful about our events with the safety of our staff, participants, and spectators continuing to be our top priority. The events team is ready to hit the ground running as we get approval to do so. That does conclude my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, John. I really appreciate that report. And 
you know, I know our family and, and I know my, my uh, council colleagues here as well appreciate the work that you've put in throughout the year. Um, like we said earlier, it's a little bit different, but some of the ideas that you came out to, to work with the community were just um, were phenomenal and, and really well received, right? So um, with that, um, does anyone have any questions? You can raise your hand, you can use the raise hand function or just throw your hand up. Oh, I see Stu Waven, go ahead, Director right. Stu. So do we have any, because I know uh, Biden, President Biden did say that 4th of July's could, uh, for fireworks could take place. So do we have any guidance or do we know what kind of groups are allowed presently or expected to be allowed by July 4th? Because I mean, we're still a little ways away. So what, what does that look like? That is a great question. And I wish I had a remarkable answer for you. Okay. So as of what we know today, the most we could have at the park is probably a hundred spectators. Oh. And I'm sure you can imagine that will not go over well. <laughs> so what's our what's our plan then? What's our strategy to not have 10,000 people show up on fireworks night? Well, we will definitely not be advertising for people to come and gather at the park. Right. We're going to encourage people to either stay home. You know, there's a lot of viewing opportunities from your house, other local parks. And I'm guessing people will find a way to watch the fireworks kind of like they typically do. I mean, we usually have a large crowd at the park, but I know there are thousands still of people who watch from other places. And Councilman, to, to, Director, to, to your point, um, we're gonna be monitoring between now and the 4th two. Um, you know, at our disposal, if fencing portions are required in order to do that, in order to ensure that we can have our fireworks um, of ceremony and activities, we'll do that. But right now, what we wanted to get across, in addition to all the great things that we're doing and that Don's team is planning, is we're going to have fireworks. We're going to we're going to make the fireworks happen. Uh, and I know we've had conversations. Hey. Uh, um, former council member Nagar, who's watching too, we've had conversations. All of you, and it was important because I know when you come to each of our events, all the events we talked about. You guys are ribbon cutting and then you're saying, you know what, one of my constituents came up to me and asked, are we having fireworks, right? And the answer, and I see, I see Jessica because we had this conversation, right? And the answer is yes. Even Peter asked me, are we having fireworks? And yes, Peter, <laughs> we're having fireworks. And so, um, you know, with all of your support and we've been monitoring this, but again like throughout the entire year we're just trying to find a safe way to yes and if if we're able to pull it off we're going to pull it off and things are going to look better in the summer things are going to look better in the fall things are going to look better um, by the holidays and we'll take another look and maybe provide an update for our holiday activities and and this time next year we're not talking about what we can't do and any limitations and we look forward to you know being back and better than, than, than ever. So um, a long way of saying, um, you know, we're just gonna ensure that we can just carry out the fireworks safely. And thank you, Director Hawkins. Any other questions from directors or comments? Mm -mm. All right. Well, thank you very much, Don. I really appreciate that. Um, and I know your team's working hard daily and, and will continue to do so for the community. So, and I think uh, we owe the community an extra fireworks show. So add one in at the end of the year, right? All right, maybe so. All right, thank you very much, appreciate that. Okay, we'll move on to our uh, director's report. Director Hawkins, anything from you this evening? Oh, nothing else to add, but thank you again for all the support throughout the year, thanks. Thanks, sir. Um, General Manager's report, anything this evening, sir? Nothing further tonight, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Directors, anything from anyone else? Yep. All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn this meeting to our next regularly, regularly scheduled meeting, uh, Tuesday, May 25th, 2021, we're adjourned. All right, thank you. So right now I'm going to call to order the meeting of the successor agency to the Temecula Redevelopment Agency. So could we have roll call? I bet you there are five people still here. <laughs> yes, Director Alexander. I haven't left. Uh, Director Ron. Here. Director Schwank. Happily here. Director Stewart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Chair Edwards. 
I am here. Do we have any public comments? We do not. Okay, then we'll move on to the consent calendar. And we have item 13, approve action minutes of April 27th, 2021 is the only action item. Approval. Okay. So I have a motion and a second. And could we have a roll call, please? Yes. Director Alexander? Aye. Director Ron? Aye. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Schwank? Aye. Chair Edwards? Aye. Okay, anything, executive directors report anything? Nothing further tonight. And nothing, board of directors comments? No. Okay, then we will adjourn to the meeting of Tuesday, May 25th at 5.30 for closed session with regular commencing at seven as usual. So that is the SARDA meeting. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the Temecula Public Financing Authority and I will call that meeting to order. And I think we still have five people here because it's been about 20 seconds since we had five people the last time. Yes, Director Alexander? Here. Director Ron? Here. Director Schwank? Here. Director Stewart? Here. Chair Edwards? Here. Any to Pafa public comments? None. Okay, then we have the consent calendar item number 14, approve action minutes of April 27th. And that is all. Oh. Got a motion. Second. And a second. All right. Are there still five people here? Yes. Okay, roll call. Director Alexander? Aye. Or here. Director Edwards? Aye. Director Ron? Aye. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Schwenk? Yes. Okay, so any executive director report? I'm guessing no. Any TAPAFA board of directors reports? No. So we have adjournment in to the meeting of May 25th. All right, thank you. Now, here we go. We're going to reconvene the Temecula City Council meeting with business item number 15. Receive update on police base of operations subcommittee discussions, clarify objective and consider appropriating sufficient funding to complete needs assessment and or police master plan at the request of subcommittee members, Mayor Pro Tem Ron and Council Member Stewart. And Mr. Butler, I believe you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Let me share my screen. Right, can each of you see the slides? Mm -hmm. All right. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. This item is being brought forward to the full Council at the request of the subcommittee to provide an update on the discussions to date, to seek direction on the path forward, and finally, to consider appropriating funds to cover needed consultant support costs. <clears throat> Recall earlier this year, Council Member Stewart requested that the Council consider exploring the possibility of locating a police station in town. He advised he was not advocating for the city to form its own police force, simply wanted to see the sheriff's deputies serving Temecula be based out of a station within the city limits for heightened visibility. He did comment that it could position the city to break away from the county in five, 10, 20 years from now, should future councils opt to do so. The council appointed council member Stewart and mayor pro tem Ron to the subcommittee. <clears throat> the first subcommittee meeting took place in March. The agenda for the initial meeting, which I'll review in detail in the following slides, included items such as a review of current facility costs, which totals roughly $385,000 annually, not $750,000 as stated during the council meeting. <clears throat> Staff and Captain Hall facilitated a detailed discussion of response times versus travel times. And we reviewed the talking points noted here to clearly define the objective. In reviewing the facility cost component of our current police services billing, staff walked the subcommittee through the makeup of the total cost for the fiscal year 2019-2020 fiscal year, which as I mentioned was just over $385,000 and included not only the Southwest Station Building, but a proportionate share of several other facilities that house functions 
that support the sheriff's deputies based at the Southwest station. Similar to the way the city distributes internal service costs, the various city to various city departments, the county analyzes the costs of its facilities and distributes those on a per position basis using sworn and classified positions assigned to each station or bureau. The largest component of the facility billing is for the Southwest station itself. Roughly 81% of the $360,000 annual building cost is attributable to deputies assigned to the city. Thus roughly $292,000 is assigned to the city contract. A similar exercise is done for the support functions and the facilities that they operate in. As can be seen, with the exception of dispatch at roughly $51,000, <clears> the other support function costs are relatively minor. If the, city provided a, if the city provided a facility, unless all support functions were housed in that city building, the support costs would continue. And rather than paying the county for the use of the Southwest station, an internal service charge would be assigned to the police budget. Staff and Captain Hall reviewed the average response time statistics to clarify that deputies respond to calls for service from their beats while on deployment, not from a centralized station. Captain Hall advised these fluctuate monthly depending upon depending on type of call and the manner in which the call was initially entered into the computer aided dispatch or CAD system. The deputies serving our law as our law enforcement officers use their vehicles as their office, not a desk at the station, thus reducing response times. Unfortunately, following the council's discussion on February 23rd, one press article quoted that it took up to 45 minutes to respond to a call on the south end of town. As can be seen here, considering the entire city, the average for a priority one call is 6.12 minutes. The quote was taken out of context as the council and Captain Hall were talking about travel time and not necessarily response times. <clears throat> as noted in the uh, original staff report, the Southwest Sheriff Station is just one component of the Southwest Justice Center, which also includes the Southwest Detention Center, the local jail, local offices for the district attorney, and Riverside County Courts. This campus-like setup offers efficiencies when considering the interaction needed by deputies beyond just response and patrol. Additionally, this station includes a fleet services facility which eases logistical challenges when a patrol unit is temporarily removed from service. Staff sought clarification on what was to be evaluated. Existing city facilities, existing vacant buildings, or vacant land for a potential build to suit option. The subcommittee felt that all options should be considered. This led to a discussion on what size facility is needed to serve the operation. Staff recommended a needs assessment be performed to determine size of facility for the operations being housed at the in-town police station, parking demands, et cetera. And lastly, if the goal was to look to the future and to have sheriff's deputies occupy a building within the city limits, do we consider the sphere of influence? At some point in the future, the current Southwest Justice Center would be within the city limits as annexations follow the sphere of influence, shown as the yellow line on this map. The Southwest Justice Center is located at the Green Star. At this point, the discussion shifted slightly in that the objective was more to it's the objective was clarified as more to position the city to form its own police force at some point in the future, rather than house sheriff deputies serving under the current contract scenario at a base of operations within the city limits. Finally, we reviewed timeline and budget, and it was explained that those are greatly dependent upon the objective and scope of evaluation. For our takeaways, clearly, it was a needs assessment must be completed so that we can understand what size facility compound we are looking to evaluate. Staff was to reach out to CityGate, the public service consultant that recently completed the regional JPA policing feasibility study and had knowledge of local operations. The subcommittee discussed doing site visits to similarly situated cities, including Murrieta, Menifee, and perhaps even some San Diego County cities. The subcommittee requested staff research ballpark costs of facilities for Marietta, Menifee, and Moreno Valley. And finally, 
Mayor Pro Tem Ron recommended the subcommittee return to the full city council to confirm the path forward. <clears throat> Prior to the second meeting, which took place in April, staff reached out to CityGate. They recommended a starting point be the current staffing model serving the city now when determining a needs analysis. They advised that additional supervisory and support staff will likely be required, similar to the scenario they presented in the regional JPA study. CityGate then posed an interesting question. If the city had a facility of our own, would the sheriff use it? Given they must still maintain a presence in the unincorporated area and the Southwest Justice Center. Per Captain Hall, the answer to that question is more than likely yes, but details would need to be worked out, specifically citing numerous factors to consider when splitting up the current Southwest Command. <clears throat> The staff report covers these general items in more detail, things to consider when splitting up the current Southwest Station Command, separation of county deputies, SROs, canines, special teams from their counterparts assigned to the city are no longer together for briefings. Information exchange suffers, supervision is separated. It's more difficult to shift staff around to ensure proper deployments during critical incidents or during times of increased employee absence, say, a global pandemic that impacts the force. <clears throat> Command and control separation will require dedicated supervisors and managers at the new facility, the same point that uh, CityGate made. The public lobby, lobby will drive dedicated front office support staff. They release police reports. They take care of vehicle and property releases, arson, sex offender, narcotics offenses get registered there. Crime report processing and routing takes place. Mail and referral processing is handled there. Public lobby pub these public lobby functions will require a desk deputy for counter reports. There'll be a need for on-site evidence storage, dedicated staff to manage evidence and the transport of this evidence to and from the court as chain of custody is critical in this situation. Specialized equipment will be required to ensure the security and safety of evidence biohazard evidence dryers, commercial refrigerators, freezers, weapon storage, fentanyl and similar hazardous storage is required. On-site logistics support for vehicle fleet, weapons management and related equipment need to be considered. And separation of equipment, which requires an excess for reserves, 20% overage to allow for repairs, service and extended shifts for issued equipment. That translates to more cars, more radios, more less lethal equipment, more body-worn cameras, riot gear, et cetera. Building enhancements will need to be considered for in-custody holding. These are required by the Department of Justice, the Board of State and Community Corrections, and Department of Corrections. And experience shows the facility will be a location for demonstrations, so building hardening will likely need to be considered and sufficient secure parking to facilitate fleet and deputy safety and in custody management will need to be taken into consideration. And finally, the building will need an area large enough for personal training and operational briefings. <clears throat> During this second meeting, the subcommittee and staff had a lengthy discussion attempting to hone in on the final objective. Council Member Stewart shared that his preference is to perform a deeper dive rather than to use existing services as a starting point. Again, reiterating that his preference is to position the city to stand up its own police force at some point in the future. He elaborated, sharing that he wanted to learn more about the positive impact some cities experienced situating a police station in problem areas of town. And additionally, he shared that he was bringing this issue forward at this time, recognizing that appropriately sized parcels of land are becoming less and less available, and the fact that the city's current fiscal position allowed for such an investment. Council Member Ron once again confirmed that public safety is the council's number one priority, but he wanted to bring this item back before the council in this setting to make sure the full council understood the ask and agreed with the path forward. Subsequent to that second meeting, staff circled back with CityGate again and requested a scope of services and cost estimate for the deeper dive. CityGate explained that when contemplating a standalone police force, typically a programming and planning document such as a police master plan should be completed. To clearly lay out the desired type and level of police services the council and the community expects. 
this level of, this level of effort would run anywhere from 125 to 140 thousand dollars and likely take nine months to complete. Costs could be slightly higher depending on the number of site visits, field trips, and community engagement sessions that are facilitated. This is consistent with the effort put forth when planning our current civic center. At the time we were contemplating the facility we're in today, staff and our design consultant immersed ourselves in the details of a local government base of operations. A similar planning effort went into, went into identifying current and future staffing demands and service demands that will be delivered from this facility. The architect then converted that into a space plan that drove the size of the Old Town Civic Center that we know today. And this effort was incidentally completed prior to us identifying the full funding plan for this project. <clears throat> As the council prepares to discuss this item and provide direction, staff felt, was, staff felt it was important to provide an update on another public safety issue that will impact the city's finances over the coming five-year fiscal planning window. We've been working with Cal Fire on the relocation of station state-owned Fire Station 12, just up the street here in Old Town. That station is aged and no longer meets the needs of Cal Fire. They have acquired a property just east of the city near Anza and Di Portola and are in the process of designing and will be constructing a new state-run fire station to house not only state engines serving the state response area, but also additional heavy equipment the state uses to address wildland fires. Given that the city currently stages a city fire crew and engine at station 12, and the other city fire stations are located to complement this station's location as it relates to primary response areas, staff is recommending the city work with the state to acquire this facility and have it continue to serve as a city fire station. And we'll be recommending the council consider programming funds for this, as well as a major renovation in the city's five-year financial forecast. And finally, additional things to keep in mind when considering a city police force is that there will be impacts to existing departments. Our, the human resources and risk management department is impacted. The city attorney's office will likely need to be enhanced um, and finance payroll operation will need to be supplemented. And the city clerk records management department will likely need to be supplemented as there's naturally gonna be an increase in public records requests. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, that concludes my update. Subcommittee members Ron and Stewart may have additional comments, and I wanted to let you know that Captain Zach Hall is available to respond to operational questions. And I also have um, Stu Gary and Gary Elliott from CityGate with us this evening, as well as their associate Jeff Katz from JK Architecture available to answer any questions. And I understand there are some public comments for this item. So before you open it up for general council discussion, um, we have to get to those, but we're happy to any, answer any questions you may have. Okay, does anybody have questions first? None, none. Okay, now I've got a full screen. Uh, I don't see any hands up. Okay, so um, Randy, you wanna go ahead to public comments? Yes, Madam Mayor, we have, uh, I believe eight or nine public comments. Okay, thanks. And the first one is from Christine Massa. Thank you very much for looking into options for local policing. It's clear that you are listening to residents by at least looking into our options. I support the city performing a feasibility study on an RCSD police station in a central location within Temecula, as well as a study on Temecula having its own police department. The next speaker is Gia Reda. Thank you for looking into ways to improve policing in our beautiful and diverse city. I am writing to encourage you to approve the expenditures to complete the feasibility study of a police station and the feasibility study of a standalone independent police force. I understand that this can be somewhat expensive and time consuming, but I believe it is a worthwhile expenditure and it is a positive step in improving the quality of police service we receive in our growing city. The next speaker is Vic McDowell. As a longtime law enforcement official, I know the importance of having a municipal police department. Police departments are more in tune with the community-based policing needs of a growing progressive community. <clears throat> municipal police departments are also more accountable to the citizens and the governing body of the jurisdictions they provide services for. The people of a vastly growing city like Temecula deserve their own police agency, a department that is directly accountable to the citizens of the city. 
a department that is accountable to our city's deployment and budget concerns, a department where police employees are present at city council employees, at city council meetings, also a police commission to help improve the partnership of the community and the police department. The next speaker is Summer Berg. Thank you for hearing our concerns and considering a feasibility study for a police station or an independent police department. I would just like to take a moment to urge the council to vote in favor of the studies. I truly believe that we should know what our options are before we can know what course is best for Temecula. These studies are vital to making an informed decision on such an important matter. Please vote in favor of them. Thank you for your time and consideration. The next speaker is M. Golden. Please conduct a feasibility assessment. Temecula needs its own police department. We need transparency and accountability. The next speaker is Tim McDonald. I applaud the city for taking a closer look at having our own police station and standalone police department. With the tens of millions of dollars a year that we spend on policing, the cost of these feasibility studies is a relatively small price to pay to check in on that service. I would like to thank Council Member Stewart and Mayor Pratamron for their work on the subcommittee and for bringing forward the suggestion to have an independent third party take a deeper look at one of the city's most important services. Thank you all for your time tonight and your consideration on this topic. The next speaker is Allison Donio Donahue Bakes. I'm a, res I'm a Temecula resident and have lived here since 1998. I would like to make a comment on agenda item number 15. I am in favor of Temecula conducting a feasibility study on both a police station and an independent police department. This is a valuable investment in our community as I believe that a city based police force rather than a county based police force is in our best interest. Having local control increases the likelihood of transparency and oversight. So we know where taxpayers are going. We also are hoping for a community focused service focused police force, one that acknowledges where we can improve in building partnerships with an eye towards social justice. We have seen our neighbors to the north of us, Menifee, create their own police force and according to reports are saving money. Please vote to conduct a feasibility study for the city of Temecula. The next speaker is Julie Gary. I'm Julie Gary, a resident of Temecula and I have lived in this valley since 1997. I would like to sincerely thank you for putting forth this needs assessment and police master plan proposal. Public safety is an important investment in our community and I'm pleased that you are looking into the fiscal impacts it has on our community. The needs assessment will determine if a police station or a standalone police department would be a fiscally responsible choice for Temecula. As a scientist, I know that it is important to gather data first to make evidence-based decisions. Currently, our monthly and yearly reports do not give detailed data and analysis on expenditures, goals, achievements, and other metrics. I encourage you to allocate funding for this project and make a small investment for both studies so that we can have greater transparency into the costs of the Riverside County Sheriff's Office. It is important that policy on policing in Temecula be based on current data and evidence to make fiscally responsible informed decisions for the community. The next speaker is Jay Alarcon. I'm a resident of the city of Temecula and a practicing psychotherapist in Riverside County. I would like to make a comment on agenda item number 15. After extensive work with Riverside County and Riverside University Health Services, I am in favor, RUHS, I am in favor of Temecula conduct, conducting a feasibility study on both a police station and an independent police department. As a flourishing and expanding com community, it is imperative that we provide adequate services that are provided in many of the metropolitan cities neighboring us today. San Diego Police Department and Los Angeles Police Department both have dedicated 911 response lines for mental health crisis calls, something that Riverside County does not. I've spoken with Sheriff Bianco and Captain Hall about these increasingly dangerous issues to which they argue that Riverside County Sheriff's Department is a large institution which requires extensive time to adapt and change. Temecula should be on the forefront of Riverside County and have a preventative approach to policing as opposed to reactive approach. If Temecula had local control, this would be something that would take months to accomplish as opposed to years. While there are many other reasons why an independent police department is needed, being a clinician gives me insight and subject matter expertise that this police department does not have. This is not about attempting to replace or abolish the police department, but rather to ensure that politics and notoriety, notoriety are, not being put, are not being put above Temecula constituents. 
And the last speaker is Karen Brand. I am not in support of a standalone police force or funding a study in an effort to do so. Madam Mayor, that's all the public comments. Okay. Um, council members, do you wanna discuss? I mean, how, how would you like to discuss? Do you wanna go one at a time? Um, anybody wanna go first? Maybe Stu or, or Matt, maybe you wanna go first. Okay, Can Stu. First? Okay, yeah. get close to your microphone because I can't. Okay. So um, I, I think there was a little confusion and even, you know, we discussed it in uh, our committee meeting, confusion uh, exactly what we were doing here um, because uh, there was an impression given that I was somehow looking at creating our own police department, which I'm not against, but I'm also not in favor at this time. However, I do know just from being in government for four years that things only get more expensive. And I thought if we don't look at this and somewhere down the road, a city council um, looks back at us and goes, why didn't they uh, do some, for lack of financial planning? I mean, uh, 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 something that in the future they can actually benefit from and, and and see that's what i'm i'm saying right here is is the fact that you know here we're talking about creating a fire fund for future uh fire stations and upgrading fire facilities and we should be doing that for a police fund whether it be a police station whether it be uh some some sort of uh fund that going forward we can tap into without tapping out basically our, our uh, budget. And so, um, and, and so it, it really came down to, I personally feel, and that's why I think we need to, I feel we need to study it more. I think we need to go a little deeper dive because like I said, I'm not, I'm not here saying we gotta do this. This is, you know, this is a uh, do or die situation, but I think without studying it further, I think we're doing our citizens a disservice um, because I, I do see possibly a day when we might want to have our own PD and uh, without any estate planning, uh, we will not have any, their property in Temecula is drying up. And even when, you know, they, he showed the map and how Southwest is in our sphere of influence, but it's so still far away from the, the heart of our Temecula residents. And so that's why I think it's important to centralize, you know, our policing operation uh, where our residents are. And, and the whole idea of demonstrations, it's like I cornered Captain Hall and he said, yeah, you know, because City Hall is our demonstration spot. I mean, how many demonstrations have we had here in the last year and a half, two years? I mean, this is the place. They're not going to go to some industrial park that we have a police station in and do a protest. They wanna be seen. So they're gonna come here to City Hall. This is where the processes are gonna be. So we've already done that. And as far as being hard, yeah, City, hard, City Hall was hard to build. I mean, it, was it worth it? Yeah, I mean, look at what it did to Old Town. So, so that's what I'm saying. You know, We might say it's not worth it right now, but we won't know until we actually build it. I mean, to me, that's, that's what we're sacrificing. We're sacrificing the future based on the present. And, and I, I'm, I think that's a wrong move. I think we need to look forward to the future and, and plan for it. And so if we build a station here and we never form our own police department, that is okay. That is not something we're gonna look back on and go, doggone it, we should have never built this station because our officers will be here, they'll be centrally located. And uh, you know, to me, that's, that's value. Um, and, and so, but, but again, that's something I need to know more details on, you know, to me, that's, we need data. We don't have data. And so that's why I think we need to take this deeper dive. You know, we, we definitely have the money to do this, you know, as far as the deep dive, let's, let's look at this thoroughly. So, uh, citizens now and in the future won't be going, why didn't they? And, and that's and that's where I'm at. I, I just I just want to clear the air, clear my head, and either we do it or we don't. But I want to do it with some data behind it. I just don't want to say, hey, let's just do it. Let's spend all this money, or hey, let's not do it because it's going to cost too much money. 
that we would have never built City Hall if that were the case. So that's what I'm asking the City Council. Let's step up. Let's do this deep dive. Let's let's get some real data and let's let's go from there. Um, Stu, if you if you if you're done, I need to um, get a motion to extend is 10 o'clock, and so we need to extend. Let's go to 10:30. I think that should be enough. Oh yeah, so moved. We'll see. Okay, motion. I need a second. Second. Okay, so we can all say all in favor. Aye. Aye. To extend. <laughs> Thank you very much, and that's on videotape. Okay, and let me Stu, let me get some um, clarification from Peter. I'm reading the item 15. And so receive update on police base of operations subcommittee discussions, okay? Clarify objective and consider appropriating sufficient funding to complete needs assessment and or police master plan at the request of subcommittee members, Mayor Pro Tem, Ron and council member Stewart. Yep. And so I know I have a, is, does that reflect what the motion was that we approved at the meeting? Uh. Well, I think I the, motion, the motion was just to look into this. It really, really wasn't anything specific like okay, that. Okay, I just want to make sure we don't get outside, you know, that Peter doesn't have to flag us down or anything. So, Greg, you sent me the exact well, thing. The, the recommendation um, comes from the subcommittee that was charged with looking at these issues. Okay. So, to talk about either the, just the building or the building in a study of whether or not you want to establish a police department is well within the agenda item that you're considering tonight. Okay, all right. I could not remember what the motion was and I thought we were okay looking at the um, yeah. item 15. Okay, so we've got, our ex um, we've got our additional time to discuss and I got clarification on that. So Matt, do you um, wanna- Madam Mayor, if, if I may, um, we, we have our consultant on the line and Stu, if you can uh, maybe unmute yourself and provide some comments to address um, Council Member Stewart's request. Do you have clarity on what he's looking to see and uh, perhaps lend some, some guidance on this? Uh, good evening, Stuart Gary, the Public Safety Principal for CityGate Associates. A uh, long time uh, public servant and I've been doing uh, emergency services consulting for quite some time now. We did the regional JPA study and, and you're one of probably three communities in the county in the JPA study that are eventually large enough now or in the future to even consider having your own police services. It, it takes a certain size and scope and financial wherewithal to do everything a police department needs. It's not just putting officers on the street, it's putting well-trained, well-equipped, safe, effective officers on the street and investigators and evidence processing and, and inputting to the judicial system. So what we told staff was, you have a fork in the road. If you want to have a, a more conceptual facility assessment, take the JPA information that we have in depth, inflate it by, uh, I'll use a consultant term, a fudge factor uh, for city growth, and, and have a JK architecture, our, our, who does a lot of public safety buildings with us, say, you know, you're in the neighborhood of X thousand square feet. And if you inflate that sum, you're probably looking at X acres because you need public parking, you need secure uh, uh, agency parking, you need a central facilities act, the generators, the whole nine yards. And, and for a relatively small amount of money, you come up with what we would call a thumbnail sketch. Hey, it's more likely than not, you need at a minimum of, pick a number, 40,000 square feet on two acres. And at today's construction costs, the land and the building is gonna cost you X to Y. Mm -hmm. That at least may be uh, in some communities would say, no, no, thanks. Just, just not going to go there at this time in our community arc. Europa Valley right now uh, is, is one of your peers who went the other way. They had the very same council conversation a few months back, and they took the more aggressive fork in the road. And, they, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. I'm not saying follow your peers. I'm just suggesting that they said, let's go deep. This is the time to find possibly a pen and multi parcel, know roughly how many square feet we need. When we're asked that question, we responded with form follows function. Don't go just look at police buildings to begin with. You have to say, what are our community policing needs and services? 
What are our risks today? And risks aren't just population types, but sensitive businesses, critical infrastructure, what, what does policing embrace? Work backwards from your general plan growth forecast mm -hmm. and your current risks and say, we probably had build out of the general plan, need a police department of X services. And, and we're capable of extrapolating that into patrol strength, detectives, headquarters support, training, property evidence, logistics, right? You build the whole org chart out. And then when you get, let's say 150 full-time equivalent personnel, much less space for volunteers and, and public good uses, then we turn to JKA and say now, how big a building is that? And the building is specialized spaces, it's circulation, it's lobby, it's public meeting spaces, it's secure evidence spaces, it's parking lot, everything I outlined two minutes ago. And then based on current construction costs, we deliver a report saying a police services master plan looking into the future likely is 150 personnel and it's 75,000 square feet. And in today's dollars, that's pick a number, 20 million. Uh, and our construction costs very high this year. Yes, you all, you all know that from other public works projects and the general state of affairs in the nation right now in construction costs, but, but it's a number. It, 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 it's, it's a number to say, we want to start saving possibly, yes, that's my administrative assistant. And I've just give a, give a, given up. I've just given up. I heard in the, the background and I'm thinking there's a cat in my office. Yeah, there is, there is. At this time of night with the with the home office windows open, the orange Sounds tabby's very on. cute. The orange tabby's on the prowl and I've just given up. Very cute. So it's more distracting to say cat leave. So <laughs> you, you take that FTE count and then in our discussions with your city manager and Greg, you don't necessarily go set aside, pick a number, $40 million today. The plan could say set, uh, set up a 10-year plan to save incrementally for separation. But in the meantime, go find a great parcel that's even maybe a bit more generous, but it's at a good spot in the road network heart of the city. We heard that this evening. And, and maybe step one of a plan is, is do some land acquisition things after you, you get the master plan. So step one's a master plan. Step two is do some land acquisition. And then you start to, in the outer year CIP say, we eventually have to come up with, with X million in future dollars to do something. I'll take a breath now and say, having said all that, that's the easy part. Understand that if you separate from a regional police department, and very few do it successfully because of all the technical and legalities and policing. It is not necessarily ever totally less expensive. You may still need a contract for certain regional specialty services, arson bomb, dog, mm -hmm. rotary wing aircraft, mm -hmm. right there, uh, advanced forensics laboratory uh, 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 issues. Hazmat. Hazmat. All of these other issues also are add-ons. Also restarting a workforce assumes in a very competitive police department or police marketplace in California that your pay and benefits is going to attract the best and the brightest because that's what Temecula expects. And, and where are 100 and, and what the JPA study ended up with. Are they coming from? Where are you going to get hundreds of officers at all rank structures to leave their current employment situation and transfer, especially the mid-career and senior careers? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm an ex-school board member and city council member in retirement. I get local control. I've lived my whole government career in suburban city government. I get it. And I would probably personally vote for local control when the right factors align. But those factors are steep and they're serious. And I would just encourage you, the city gate team, and, and I'm stepping a little bit on Gary Elliott here, who's a retired undersheriff and understands this even better than uh, I, I do, the retired fire chief EMS expert. You, you um, uh, really need to think through that ultimately separation means restarting a fresh culture with a lot of lateral hires from a lot of different agencies. And that's gonna require exquisite recruitment and exquisite startup management to generate a new positive culture. 
you just can't throw 100 people into the blender and say, you, you, you now speak to Temecula. So a little bit of a soapbox, maybe a bit more than you wanted this evening. I think you're all asking the right questions. Uh, and I, I think you have three forks in the road. Do nothing, do a little bit, or, or come up with a police, a police master plan uh, with community engagement. Okay, so I, I think what's where you took it is way farther than I was going to take it. I mean, literally what I want to do is create a report that says if we were to uh, uh, start our own PD or even as a uh, city, where would be the best place logistically to put a police station that further down the road? See, I'm not, I'm not looking for that deep of a dive when you're talking all that. I mean, to me, that's, that's not where I was going with this whole thing. I literally just wanted to put us in a position, secure property, maybe even um, uh, set up a fund or something that gets us ready to, to make that move down the road. I mean, and, and I'm not talking, and that's gonna be another city council that's gonna make that decision. But this city council, I think we are in a literally, like you said, a fork in the road that if we push this off another five years or another 10 years, it, it almost becomes a point of no return where you've, you've lost your opportunity because now all the land is gone. We've already developed it out. We've got, we got small pockets of developable land right now. And so unless we purchase property and redevelop it, literally knock it down for that purpose, and so, but, but we don't have to right now. We actually have some land that could possibly, and that's something I want CityGate to look at, saying based on these parcels that we have, are these, are these doable? Do they fit within that frame of a police station footprint? And then secure those property for that purpose. And, and so that's really what, that's the deep dive. I'm not talking about going in and looking at all the, you know, logistics of hiring and, you know, all that stuff that that I don't think we're ready for that. And I don't think we're ready for that separation either. But that being said, I think we might come to that point in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is. But I, I really feel at this point, this is a point in time that is not going to exist ever again. And so that's where I'm, I'm wanting to push us at least to look at it. So it, going down, uh, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, they're going to point back and say either, thank God they did something or, oh my God, why didn't they? And that's, and that's, that's where I'm at right now. I, I think we need to have that data and that understanding of what that looks like. And right now I don't, it's a bunch of fuzzy math out there right now. And so, you know, and, and for some reason, it, it kind of, I always get sucked down the road of uh, our own PD. And that's not where I'm going with this. This is not our own PD. I think we need to secure for our city's future that piece, that whatever. And that's a crucial piece. Everybody knows the number one most expensive part of creating a PD is the station. And if we can put put those wheels in motion that a city council five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, that we've already set that, that train in motion. We already have the land secured. We already have a fund established. We already have, you know, so, so when, that, when that trigger happens and we decide, and, and we all know this city hall, what took 10 years to build, you know? So, so we all know everything takes so long to do. So at this point, I think we just need to, think this is not happening overnight. This is something we're gonna have to develop out and it's gonna be a slow grind, just like City Hall was a slow grind, but look at what it did for Old Town. You know, so, so that's, that's what I'm saying. We don't know the impacts this is gonna have on policing until we do it or not do it. And, and that's, that's some of the data I wanna see. I wanna see, I wanna see those comparisons of cities who, who have built their own police station but still contract. I wanna see that. I wanna see how that helped or didn't help. You know, was that money well, well vested or not well vested? So 
So Stu, let me, let me um, give you a little bit of history about City Hall. So um, Temecula proper, the city, city government proper was located in a rental facility that really wasn't constructed at all for a city hall. Not, not the one that we all know as our previous city hall, but we were in a building that and took over a bunch of office suites. Um, and it happened to have been a building right behind city hall um, where BMW management is, if you know where that is. So, um, but then when we moved into this, previous city hall building, that building came on the market. It was a, it had been, a, you know, vacant. Um, I don't know if it was a foreclosure, but we got it for, I mean, Jeff Stone always said it was a steal. That building was a steal. So we had a master plan at the time that said that built, we knew exactly how long it would take us probably to, based on the amount of growth we were having at the time, the amount of development that we would probably be able to occupy that city hall for about 15 years um, and it would house um, city staff um, sufficiently because we knew about how many people it was going to take to handle the load of growth protection maintenance and everything that the city does and we outgrew that city hall literally almost to the day um, that we said we would outgrow it the um, city council members had given up. You know, I had a closet. Ron Roberts and I shared literally a, what it was a closet. And we couldn't both be in there at the same time. There was room for a desk and one chair and that was shoved up against the wall. So we really didn't have offices. Uh, the mayor had an office. Um, we really didn't have a council conference room where we could have side meetings. It was a room that had one of those louver doors made out of plastic cloth or something. So you could, you know, there was no privacy, but we literally outgrew City Hall um, right at the time that we said we would. At the same time, we were doing a complete renovation and redevelopment of Old Town. So we did an Old Town uh, study to develop an Old Town master plan. And we hired a, a, a great nationally known firm called Kaiser Marston. And that took a year, just the study of the master plan for Old Town. And it came back to us and it said, and this is when Old Town, you could shoot a cannon down Old Town Front Street on a Saturday and hit nothing, no cars, no people, no nothing. Um, Old Town was dying, basically dying and starting to get blighted. So we knew we had to do something. So Kaiser Marston said, you want to revive Old Town, put your community theater down there. Well, we didn't have a community theater um, and, and build your civic center. Well, everybody thought they were crazy. I mean, there was nothing going on down there, including people and stores weren't staying open at all, maybe open two days a week or something. So we went ahead, developed the master plan, and just knowing that we had developed that master plan spurred growth in Old Town, even before we got finished with the theater, way before we got finished with the Civic Center. Um, so that's why it took all that amount of time. We developed that master plan. And so we knew we were going to need a new city hall because we had already planned. We knew we were going to outgrow it in 15 years, and, and it really did come true. It was 15 years. So that's a little bit different then to me, it seems like if we, I mean, if we can go ahead and do a study, that's fine, but it seems like we're getting the cart ahead of the horse. If we go ahead and build a building that we don't need before we determine whether or not we want to have our own police department. I, I know, I just feel like we need to do that first. And I, I, you know, there are several parcels that would be viable. So I'm, I'm not worried about that so much. And the cost is, you know, that's always going to be a factor. And I don't like that. It's, it's really expensive right now. Everything's gone up so much just in the last year. But I kind of feel like we need to make the other decision first before we decide to, you know, spend the money and the time to go ahead and, and develop uh, a building. And, and maybe we need to, I saw all the comments that Greg had in, in his report. Um, all the things that it's going to require to maintain two buildings, because we'd still have to be in French Valley, I guess, and we'd still have to have people in this building uh, because of the jail in the, you're shaking your head, no, we don't, because that's what the police chief was saying, I thought, that we had no, to staff two buildings. There's certain, no, no, it's the Southwest, uh, his uh, uh, territory is, is all the Southwest territory. So he has his staff 
that's going to staff that. And then any, anybody who actually would police a Temec Temecula would, would uh, station out of the, the local police station. But see, everybody seems to be missing it. I, I'm, I want to do the study. I want to secure the property. I want to create a fund so the money is there that we could do it. I'm not saying let's build a, let's build a building right now. Uh, you know, I, I've said a thousand times, it could take 10 years to build this building. Yeah, and we, and we always do set money aside, so that's true. You know, we, we don't have, have anything plan. right now, nothing set aside for a possible police station or any public safety uh, fund specifically for uh, policing. And, and that's what I like to see created because anything is gonna be better than nothing. And, and you know, you say we have plenty of land, but virtually every piece of land that, that I can see is vacant, there is a proposal on that property to do something with it. And that's where I feel like if we don't get something locked up for our purpose, we're gonna miss the boat. We're gonna have to buy something. We're gonna have to demo something. We're gonna have to do something. And raw land is getting hard to find in Temecula. Well, the city still got a couple of, we still have a couple of parcels. That, but but yeah. look at the proposals on all those parcels. Uh, I don't know, but okay, I understand what you're saying, but I just, I don't know, I just feel like we need to make the, the, other, the other decision first. No, it's never going to be cheaper, uh, you know, it, the same applies to the police station, and I know police station is going to be really expensive. The other thing that's going to be a, a main expense is salaries and pensions. We're talking about pensions now, which we don't have to worry about, and liability. So um, I don't know, Matt. Are you are you signaling me? Yes, I am. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so I, I we're a little little off uh, topic from where I thought we would be. Um, but you know, I think I think you make a good point is, you know, why are we having a conversation about a facility and, and putting a fund aside and all of that, if not to have a conversation about starting our own police department, mm -hmm. right? It's hard to isolate these two things from one another because right now, you know, the question I'd have for CityGate folks, uh, if they're still on the line, um, the question I would have for them is, you know, let's, let's say we build a wonderful station in the middle of town that has, you know, all the features and bells and whistles. From my perspective, and I said this at our, our meetings too, is what does that mean us as far as improved response times, improved crime statistics, mm -hmm. costs? You know, I, I mean, look, costs aside, I need to know that what we do here moves the needle in some meaningful way on something with regard to law enforcement. And I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand how a building just plain and simple, a building does that, right? Because, you know, from my perspective, there's not a single city, you know, I mean, I shouldn't say that. The dominant conversation now in policing and law enforcement is not on, on a national or statewide level having anything to do with facilities, right? The dominant conversation is about community policing and mental and behavioral health services. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that law enforcement need right now to be able to do their job better that they don't currently have. You know, if you look at all of the legislation, so I sit on the, you know, public safety subcommittee for the League uh, of Cities, and I know both at the state level, we just reviewed all the, all the bills that are coming down. There is a lot of legislation coming down to tell law enforcement in the state of California, let alone federal legislation, how to do their job. So, you know, I, I got this great bit of uh, uh, advice and analogy from somebody in law enforcement who I uh, respect quite a bit. And, and they said, you know, uh, they used the analogy of um, uh, Autopia at Disneyland. <laughs> Did you ever go to Autopia at Disneyland? Yes. That it's that ride you take your kids on that, you know, lets you drive a car, but not really, right? Because the wheels are blocked in the middle by this, you know, and, and the analogy was used that said, you know, look, law enforcement is so heavily regulated. And this is what I need to understand myself too. Whether we're Riverside County Sheriff's Department or whether we're Temecula Police Department, my understanding is we're, we're all heading basically down the same track and whether we have four inches of play or five inches of play on either <laughs> side, you know, yeah. the, the law enforcement is so heavily regulated that 
what, you know, not only what does it, you know, what does the facility gain for us as far as crime statistics or effectiveness, but what, what does that change as far as, you know, our ability to dictate policy or anything else, right? I just don't see how this all fits together. And my understanding is, is that, and, you know, again, maybe our, our folks on the line and, and our own law enforcement folks would help me understand this. From my perspective, if I have $20,000 or $20 million to spend tomorrow, I would want to put it toward the things that make the most sense from a law enforcement improvement perspective. I get the whole long range planning thing, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of other things right now that we need to address as well. So it's really difficult. I mean, we're playing triage here, but it's really difficult. I'd say one other thing is the, you, you, Stu, you brought up the fire station thing. That investment in the fire station is, is simply for us to keep status quo. It's oh, yeah. not for us to improve anything. Yeah. It's because the state's bailing on that station and we need to make an investment in it. So we just basically maintain services in the city, right? So that was an unexpected expense, but it's hard to compare those two because we could let it go completely. And now we're out of station in Old Town and all of our response times and resource allocation is gonna shift. You know, So it's hard to compare the two, but if, if our folks from CityGate or somebody could weigh in, just help me understand what you know, what a station, what a what a building gets us, and help me understand why I would want to have a conversation about creating our own police department. Because I hear all these arguments about local control and all of that, and and I'll say this, and I've said this to other people as well. If I ever for a moment felt like we didn't have local control, yes. then I would be the first one out there advocating for our own police department. But we have a fantastic relationship. And the ability to maneuver with our police department, you know, they are Temecula Police Department as far as I'm concerned, and mm -hmm. they maneuver with us to address the concerns that we have. So, so I'll just back off for a second and just say if we could just start with the, you know, what does a facility gain us as far as effectiveness or operations? Yeah, what does it get us that we don't already have? I see Stu unmuted. Stu? No, I'm... So, oh, so yeah. you're, you're... Sorry, other Stu. No, I just I just want to clarify with Stuart, the uh, city gate guy. So, um, have you done studies with other cities who have built police stations, and what effectiveness had that created? I, I think that's kind of where Matt and I are kind of looking at. Is like that's that's what I want to know too. I want to know if building a facility within your your city limits is there an effectiveness bonus slight so, slight okay because because of the beat map you saw earlier with dispersed units responding to calls beat staffing strength at peak hours of the day yields better response times mm -hmm. and critical response times are a paw on the cat of the total workload in a police department you're not going to 911 calls every minutes of every hour you're doing community policing, you're doing low priority call for service policing, mm -hmm. and that takes a distribution of officers backed up by a central headquarters staff. Some agencies prefer the downtown feel. I can cite very urban clients who have rebuilt, condemned and built land because they want a downtown police department. Other clients uh, reuse buildings like you talked about your first or second generation city yeah. hall. Other clients put it two miles outside of downtown. Uh, distance is only covered twice a day when you leave to go to the patrol beat and you return to the station. Mm -hmm. So it's not at all like fire or EMS where I, I, I've got more of a response time constraint. Because they're in their zone so, all day long. Right, for the most part. So taking a prisoner back to the holding cell, you know, other, other issues. So we'll try to think about this. Let me try this this way. When I said form follows function. If we're asked a question as a consultant, staff says, how big a parcel for how big a building, we have no choice but to say, is it a 40 person police department or a 150 person police department? That's the purpose of, of a larger master plan. So, so at the beginning, I said, we could take the current size of the sheriff's operation, inflate it some in terms of headcount, Turn that into square footage, send you off parcel shopping and say, buy more land, 
than the, than the thumb the thumb in the wind indicates. That's one approach. That's one approach that I think gets Council Member Stewart kind of where you're at towards towards land banking. And I'll use land banking in this sense. You know, in education, most school districts know the average size of an elementary school. Yes. They know they know how many acres it is. Yes. And they can go talk to the Acme Corp you know, when they come in with a subdivision and say, you know, we want 10 acres for a school, maybe 15 or 20 years. We don't know yet. But would you give us 10 or 20 acres? They land bank it for a while within yes. state regs. You could you could go find an attractive civic parcel. Put a parking lot on it, put a park on it. You could land bank it if it's more than barely what the sheriff is consuming today in square footage. Mm -hmm. That's our caution to your staff. Don't go buy just enough land for today's situation. And in the future, you and the sheriff still have to work out co-sharing, you know, exactly how much of the city police services versus unincorporated exist in the building. You just have to answer some fundamental questions. That's just yes, not. Yes, we, we think ways. you can do that inexpensively at high altitude. You could also go the Rapa Valley Road route and get down at 10,000 feet and really do a police master plan because you're likely leaning closer than not to separation. I've never heard your staff or any of you this evening say a word that you're close to separation. Mm -mm. So start, start at 50,000 feet, get a crude understanding, metaphorically, a simple understanding of space needs in a law enforcement facility, the size the sheriff's doing today, and see if you can all find some parcels that are bigger than that, but not, you know, you're not tying up a sports park amount of acreage, you're tying up enough acreage for a future municipal secure facility. We looked and at so, 100 years for City Hall. So again, I, I, I've, been, I, I've been involved as a staff, you know, department head in the day and, you yes. know, master planning and remodeling and building City Halls. Those are almost always driven, as you described, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, with exquisite master plans and space planning and how big are the, each department going to grow and what's the public counters. Mm -hmm. um, if you just want to conceptually reserve some public safety building space, the lower cost performa leveraging the sheriff's study will get you there. But we kept hearing more detailed questions and that's when staff said, would you give us the other swing of the pendulum if, if we wanted a police master plan with a facility plan, now you're into six figures. That's an, exp that's an expensive oh, yeah. ende endeavor to listen to the community and turn actual operational needs into square footage, into parcel and utility needs to, to feed that parcel. And most of our clients, we don't tend to take your money and give you just some Pollyanna notion and walk away. If you wanna know how many acres and really want our input to make the right decision, we're gonna say we need to know more than three things. Or don't, 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 we won't take your money. We won't give you just a frivolous answer. Do it at a high level, do it at an in the weeds level. That's how I, I re-describe what you're all talking about. And uh, you're closer than you think as I sit back and, and listen to you. Uh, if you wanna reserve future opportunities, do a high level conceptual study. Don't overthink it right now. Um, could we get Captain Hall? Are you on? I know you're here. So can can you kind of weigh in on on what was uh, the comments that were just made about you know central you know centralizing the uh, a police building and um, call times and and things like that? Well, I guess I'm not sure what you want to know specifically, but like it was explained and we've talked about before. We don't follow the fire department model of deployment while we're kind of you know waiting around for a call and then we all leave together uh, our deputies leave the building at the beginning of their shift they head out to a designated area and they're under order to spend as much of the day as possible within that designated area mm -hmm. sometimes they leave for critical calls outside the area to back up another deputy maybe for an inmate transport uh, even though we try to transport inmates or in custodies with, you know, a lower level employee like a community service officer, that's not always available to us either because of the type of arrest, the type of criminal we're asking them to arrest, 
or in many other factors, or they just may not be available. Uh, but for the most part, you know, they stay in their designated areas until they're called to return to the station at the end of their watch. And so that's why the response times t- stay pretty consistent throughout the city, regardless of where the building is, because it's designed that way. We're designed by driven by calls for service, uh, critical incidents, and geographical area to how many deputies we put in a certain area at a certain time. And so that's why as we watch the uh, average response times, they, they pretty much maintain just around about the same time. Now, weather will change that, traffic conditions will change that, population growth will change that, uh, mismanagement in deployment uh, can affect that, although we try not to do that. <clears throat> Those kinds of things will affect uh, uh, the response times, but not very much. Those response times have stayed pretty steady uh, over the years, <clears throat> excuse me, and will continue to stay uh, about that steady. So let me let me just confirm what I'm hearing you say is that we don't need a centralized police station in order to maintain, you know, the um, the call times that we have now or the response times because they're in their zones already. Yes, I don't. I mean, is it possible that uh, the the business next door to the police department may get a deputy quicker sometimes than other times sure but we also get very lucky in the field too where a deployed deputy happens to be right around the corner from a call for service excuse me we've had there's several calls where our response time is literally seconds because a deputy just happens to be there Um, so sometimes it's luck and sometimes uh, it's by design i i will say that building a police department in in a certain area of town isn't going to dramatically change your response times because the, the deputy sheriffs, the policemen, they don't hang out in the police building. Right. Uh, they they're always out in the field, or I mean that's their job. Their their mobile office is their vehicle. Um, when they're not in, when they're not responding to a call for service, they're not handling a call for service. They're engaging the community in some kind of community-oriented policing, high visibility marked patrol, proactive enforcement, uh, traffic enforcement, whatever, whatever they're doing when they're not handling a call for service still benefits, you know, that geographical area that they're assigned to. Um, they don't go out and handle a call. Like they wouldn't say at the police department or the station, uh, head out into their zone or their beat to handle a domestic violence call, once that call's finished, they don't start driving back to the station just right. to be redirected. They, they start, they, they deploy some kind of tactic, uh, you know, with a uh, patrol tactic within their zone. They go to a problem area, they go check on the parks, they check on the schools, uh-huh. they check on any events that may be occurring there. They don't leave and go back to the police station to wait to be dispatched, you know, to some other part of the city. Okay, so Matt, to your point, then we can eliminate response times as something that we gain because it doesn't sound like we gain any. But Stu, to your point, you're, it sounds to me like you're more concerned about property acquisition while we can. And you know what? I need to get a motion and a second to extend again because it's 1030. So let's go move. to 11. I'll move. Okay. Need a second? Second. Stu? Okay, so all in favor. I. Okay, we're extended to 11. So you're saying it's because you want to look to the future in case we need a station, we need to acquire the property and make the plans now start setting things aside, which is typically when we plan something we do have, you know, we set it aside, start setting it aside immediately over the course of, you know, the studies, the planning and, and the construction. And so I don't know, Matt, what other areas, if you, you talk about response times, what other areas would you consider well, you know, I, I, I get where Stu's coming from on the, 
you know, wanting to think on that future and, and be able to secure property. And it's not unlike what we've done for city parks or, or you know, working with the school district to identify school sites and all that. So, mm -hmm. so I, I don't have any objection to those, you know, those ideas, right? Um, but, but again, I just go back to, we have limited time, we have limited money uh, and resources to dedicate to this. And so right now, I feel like every dollar really counts and we have to be fairly judicious with how that's spent. Um, so do I wanna spend $150,000 on a study now? No, absolutely not. Uh, would I be okay with a smaller scale version of something? Well, perhaps, right? But, but really, again, the, the, the question for me comes down to what is the most meaningful thing that we, sh we could be doing in law enforcement to move the needle right now? And, and so, you know, doing my homework on this, I'm looking at things like the, you know, uh, what, we, what we saw earlier with regard to homeless outreach and the social yeah. programs and all of that, right? You need this sort of robocop of, of a, a, you know, a, an officer that, that is able to not only fit the bill when it comes to social work uh, and, and mental behavioral health, but somebody who's, you know, a sworn officer as well, because you're not going to send a social worker into a incident that puts them at risk. They're not trained to handle that, right? They're trained to handle a clinical setting. So how do you find these folks, you know, and this is what every department is struggling with, and nobody's going to deny that this is the, this is the issue moving forward, is how do you find those folks that are able to be at that crossroads of both law enforcement and, you know, social services, if you will. Um, and, you know, and quite frankly, there are no degree programs or education or post that gives you that full skill set, right? That's something you have to, you know, seek out on your own. Um, so, so part of the conversations I've been having uh, recently, all circle around the idea that we should be investing a lot of time and resources in those conversations with our local college, with our local academies, with Riverside County sheriffs, with you know our adjacent uh, law enforcement resources as well, uh, Marietta and others, um, and to be able to identify a model, a regional model that works, so that we have an, an additional layer onto you know law enforcement that provides a kind a specific kind of service that again really changes the policing uh, capabilities to, you know, serve our, our community the best way we can. So, you know, so I would ask, you know, part of what I'd like to do is kick this back to the subcommittee uh, that, uh, you know, is for public safety and give us a little bit of leeway to do that. But, um, uh, you know, to go down that pathway to have that conversation with staff uh, and, and uh, sheriff's department, maybe with MSJC as the local uh -huh. college well, um, to start to have those conversations now. But, but, but as far as the, the acquisition pieces, um, you know, I, again, I'm just, I'm struggling to understand how a facility, you know, meaningfully changes law enforcement. If all we want to do is set up a future council to be able to have the, the portfolio to make a decision to pull a trigger on something, no pun intended, um, you know, on, on, you know, law enforcement and our own, you know, PD at some level, um, I, can we just start with an inventory of the existing parcels we have, an inventory of potential parcels that we don't have that might work, um, and, and just, you know, kind of run a quick, you know, sort of assessment on that first. Because I think, you know, if we're talking about 150 staff, roughly plus or minus, you know, cycling in and out at different times, we know what that footprint is. It's not going to be too hard to figure out how many acres, well, how many parking spaces, mm -hmm. what kind of footage, probably not dissimilar from what we have right now. How many opportunities exist right now in the city of Temecula to make that happen? You know, I'd be okay starting there, but at the same time, you know, like I say, if we're going to really tackle the law enforcement question, I want to get at the meat of what we could do now to improve operations, not, not just infrastructure, but operations. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, I, again, part of the reason I struggle with this is because, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're into motorcycles or, or firearms or, or vehicles of, of any kind for that matter, right? I have a preference of what kind of motorcycle I like. Um, it's, it's not a BMW. I think it would be cool as heck to see all of our law enforcement uh, riding around on Harleys, right? <laughs> but we, had but them for we did, but you know, it's just not something I get involved with, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a preference when it comes to that because I'm not the police officer. I'm not sitting on that, uh, that motor and I'm not you know, in that position. So I'm gonna defer to law enforcement to make that choice of what 
what makes the most sense. And unless I hear otherwise from law enforcement too, if they're saying, look, the model isn't broken, we're doing just fine, we could improve, you know, in these capabilities at our local, um, you know, stations at City Hall and at the mall and, and so forth. If, if that's what we're talking about, you know, I need to know that conversation with them because if the model isn't broken, then I don't want to go much further down this pathway either, right? And I don't need to tell them, oh, you need to go buy a Harley because I think that's the best uh, approach, right? I just, I, I don't think that's our, our purview. So I'm trying to figure out how we can, I mean, are you, are you saying we need to back up and even before where Stu, you know, wants to start, we need to back up before that and see what the needs are first, right? Needs and needs and future needs first. And obviously we're going to ask the police, what, you know, what they think and what they need. And then depending on what we come up with for future needs, looking out 30, 50 years, something like that, then we come back and have this discussion again. Here are the needs, and then we, you know, not, not really. I think the I think the thing is simple. I think I'd like to see, you know, I agree with Stu. I'd like to know what that portfolio of of properties look like right now. Mm -hmm. Have available to us what would potentially work, and what properties are still, you know, on the market, if you will, that that could potentially fit the bill, right? So before we get too far down this path, do we even have an option and what do those options look like, right? Let's start there. Um, and, you know, again, I think whether it's, uh, you know, city gate or just working with uh, Riverside sheriffs, I think we can, you know, sort of sketch out square footage and need and acreage mm -hmm. and all that, that, that we'd be looking for. So let's just make the first cut there. And I think then we can have a, a further discussion on it. As far as the operational side, that's where I'd like to see, you know, the subcommittee and the city staff and, and others, you know, working hand in hand with Riverside Sheriff, because if we're talking about pilot programs, other things to, again, meaningful changes to, you know, operations or response times or community, you know, services or mental and behavioral health, what is it that is, you know, is in front of us? Because we see the legislation right now that's being passed and talked about. We know there are big changes coming down, both in the state and federal government over the next several years. Why don't, why aren't we getting in front of that and start piloting these programs ourselves and start yeah. making Temecula a model of, of uh, you know, uh, policing? Um, but that requires, that's a very different conversation than a facilities conversation. So you're saying specialization and training? Yeah. So let's start that conversation. What do they need? You know, what are the biggest, uh, you know, biggest opportunities for, for change um, and, uh, you know, and improving policing in, in Temecula and how do we make that happen? And at the same time, let's, let's talk about the facilities. Let's see what we've got available. Let's start there at least. Um, and then, you know, if we could figure out at least what the portfolio looks like of, of properties, then let's jump into, you know, another analysis if we think that's a good idea and come up with a plan that says, you know, look, you either have property and that, that works right now, or you need something and here's some suggestions. And then we can say, do we start to set aside a fund and do we, you know, contemplate acquisitions or land swaps? Mm -hmm. I've been creative in the past. So, so Stu, oh. your, your concept is within what Matt just said, but he wants to back it up a little bit first and, you know, uh, meet with PD and, and see uh, what the needs are and see what, what's coming down the pike actually from the state in the future and the federal government in the future for policing. So your part is in there, that right. component. Well, and you know, I, I totally agree with everything Matt just said, you know, I'm totally good with that. Um, but I really do think we, um, we are in a, uh, a window of time in this city, especially um, where uh, our revenues exceed our budget. And, and I, I just want to see us basically land bank. I love the idea that Stuart said, you know, land banking and, um, and, and even setting aside, I, I, I just had this fear. Fear, <laughs> fear. fear that one day we're going to want our own PD for whatever reason, we're going to want our own PD. And if we don't make some decisions now, it's just like a snowball. And um, so, so that, that's my, my big concern. We, we've got to, and I, I'm, I, I look forward, I don't look back and I try not to react to, 
uh, situations right now. I, I want to look forward past certain things and what do I need to do to get there? Mm-hmm. And that's what I, that's, that's the way I'm thinking right now. I just want, if we go there and, and I have a feeling we're going to go there. Um, if we go there, where are we going to put it? And that's, that's kind of where I, I still think we need uh, that 50,000 foot view from CityGate and give us, give us some, some real data on where would we put it? Where would be the best place? Where, uh, you know, when talking to, you well, know, that's what Kaiser Marston did for us for Old Town, right, remember? Right. So, so you know, and and that's what I just want, like the fifty thousand foot view. I, I'm not looking for six figure uh, uh, survey. I just want, I just want them to take a look and say, okay, we're gonna need, you're gonna need this size of a footprint. What do you have in your inventory? Like Matt said, you know, we we can figure out, you know, what. But I, I still think we need to we need to at least get that fifty thousand foot view just to make a few educated decisions along the way, and okay. so I'm still in favor. I'd still like to see us do that, it, you know. And that's the lesser of the uh, deep dives. It's a it's the fifty thousand foot dive, um, and so uh, you know that I for me, that's what I, I haven't heard from anybody else, but I'm going, I'm going there right now. Yeah, so okay, go there now. Okay. So um, Zach, you want to go? Jess, do you want to go? Yes. You want to go? Okay. Jesse, let's go to you. Yeah. Mic on. Oh, thanks. You want to go first, Sarah? Mayor? No, go ahead. Oh. Go, you go ahead and go. So just so I can understand. So I only have Stu sitting here. Um, so I have a clear understanding before I vote for something. When two weeks ago, Stu, when you had asked for the, us to, or a couple weeks ago to take a look at everything, my understanding was just the distance with the prisoners. That was our first thing that we were looking at. Is that correct? Like to, to take them back and forth. Okay. And so I'm looking at it and I took some notes here and I'm looking at our, just our population sizes. We're estimating we want to max out at somewhere at 135 mm-hmm. and we're about 24,000 away from that, give or mm-hmm. take. Mm-hmm. I know the state, we might end up going over that depending upon what the, if the state forces that or whatnot. Right. But when we look at it, you know, when the population increases, the crime increases. And right now already our traffic, and I know all of us have been driving around Temecula the last couple of weeks and the traffic has been atrocious. I don't know what's going on. There must be a party going on somewhere that nobody told me about, but it's, I'm telling you, there's a lot of traffic. And so just as I'm looking at it, I'm going, what is that going to look like as we continue over the next five or 10 years? And I look at this also um, kind of as an insurance policy. I mean, I know I take out life insurance. I don't always want to talk about death, but the fact of the matter is one day I might. So this could be a very good almost insurance policy to say, hey, listen, we put some money away. We have a parcel that's really, you know, specifically for this. And if for some reason in 10 years, 15 years, we don't have what we're looking for, then we just break it apart. I mean, the, that council can do that. But I think Stu has a good point where we have to at least try and take a look at it. And that's why I'm just saying, I, my opinion is I, I'd like to at least dive deeper, take a look. We have nothing to lose. We have all to gain. So okay. that's just my thought. Okay. I have, a par- I have a parcel in my head. So go ahead, Zach. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, you know, thanks to the subcommittee for Taking a little dive into this, I feel like in some respects we've sort of gone down a rabbit hole with this conversation tonight. Like the focus of, you know, if you if you look at it, essentially like we're supposed to get direction on a needs assessment or a police master plan. I mean, and for me, you know, I have personal uh, feelings about a substation in town. Quite frankly, I don't think it would make that big of a deal. To your point, Mayor Pro Tem Ron, I don't think that physical building um, really would really add anything. There are so many other things that we can do on the ground, I think, um, that would really benefit residents and and the deputies alike. Um, You know, having said that, though, there's nothing that we've done in our city that hasn't generated from some sort of master plan or specific plan. Right. Um, Those are those guiding documents, those living, breathing documents that we constantly go back to. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when we're having this conversation tonight and we're Sort of the ifs and the and the the what ifs. I struggle with that. I don't have the data. You know, I, I read the staff report and I, and I appreciate Greg. I appreciate your your presentation tonight. But I mean, this is an extremely complex issue um, that needs solid data. Um, I'm not opposed at all to you know, looking at a little bit deeper and, and giving us 
a good guiding document um, so that we can make a decision if we want to uh, moving forward. Um, it might tell us, and then it may very well tell us um, that you don't need to do anything, right? Uh, it might tell us something different. We don't know. And that's the thing that I struggle with when we're talking about these larger issues that we're dealing with as a council right. is trying to figure out exactly what is our path, what the fork in the road, what do we take? Um, so for me, I just don't have, I don't have enough. Um, it would be no different than, you know, some of the discussions we've had uh, regarding, you know, infrastructure or the city hall or bike lanes and trails or Old Town Specific Fund. These are those documents that, that go out to the public and really gather the information so that we can make good informed decisions. And that's really um, what I'm struggling with with this. So um, I do think the subcommittee needs to see this uh, a little bit more. I think the subcommittee needs to tighten a lot of this stuff up, to be honest. Um, but I'm certainly not opposed to um, to us uh, investing in a, uh, in a in a in an actual study to um, to give us all five of us uh, really good information going forward, so we can make good sound decisions for the residents. So, Stu, knowing what your knowing what the concerns are about um, availability of land and the viability of that and the cost and how much space it's going to take and looking at X number of years, how big is it going to grow? The first thing in my mind is that we need to establish, is there, how much land is it going to be, like you said, and is there something already available? Because I think there is. So once we determine that, if we would learn that there is something already available and the city already owns something, then would you feel as anxious or, uh, you know, as urgent, or would you, would that give you a comfort level? Yes. Totally. And I actually like when um, the city guy, guy, guy said, you know, if you land bank it, turn it into a park. You know, you can always, you know, turn the park into a police station if, you know, if that's the desire years down the road. So, but you could turn it into something while it's land banked. It could be usable city property until we mm -hmm. actually want to use it. So mm -hmm. I like that idea, actually. Okay. So, um, Matt, that gives us. Yeah, you know, that doesn't give us, you know, maybe the most expensive study, but if we can, we can do an inventory on our own. I mean, Christine Damco knows every piece of property in town. So we can kind of, we can do that on our own. And then it probably wouldn't be difficult to figure out a formula for X number of officers. And you know, you need hazmat, bomb squad, gang task force, dog, you know, parking, maintenance, storage, and all that. We can probably figure out how many square feet that that building would be and we can and and they can certainly help us do that um that might give us a start that would certainly give us a starting point if we already had something available or knew that we could acquire it would at least uh you know we could have something more to discuss after that so um you, you know jess what matt what do you think yeah, no, like I say, I, I'd be more than happy to step forward with with something a little more rigorous um we're very good point about the land banking and being able to use it for other uh, needs. I think as a city, as we grow, we need to identify that. It's one of the things I said, gosh, is it like 10 years ago now? Um, <laughs> was, right? uh, was, was, you know, look, we're 85% built out back then. Yeah. And I said that last 15%, that's our identity moving forward. And if we if we mess that up, you know, we've really I lost an opportunity. So Stu, I 100%, that is, I always held that same philosophy. So we're, we are perfectly aligned on that. What that last 15% looks like specifically, well, you know, that's where we diverge a little bit, but let's see where we are with the land. Let's see if, if we're not capable of doing a back of the envelope on sizing and acreage needs and parking and all of that. If we have to, I'd be okay, you know, opening up the, uh, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity for putting city gate into a $20,000 yeah. or so, right. you know, uh, space for, for support on that. And let's just kind of, kind of see where this, where, where this takes us, because if we don't have that list of land opportunity right. for us, you know, we're, we're absolutely <laughs> going to just keep circling around the same conversation right. here and not right. make progress. That's why we have to have a starting point. So, so just. Do you agree with that? We've got to figure out, is the land available? And if it is, you know, well, do we need to acquire it? Do we already have it? Uh, you know, and I think, and, and how much land is it going to take? Well, and, and see, and I guess I'm missing something because 
like Zach, there's just not enough data for me to even know where a facility like that would want to be situated. Well, you have to know how much, how big, you well, know, true. how much land do you need first? And then, you know, but we have the inventory exactly. of land. You have, you have that study. And, and but yeah. and, and that's why I still think I need that study. I need to know, I got to have some sort of data that shows me, A, if we were going to have one, where would the best place be? B, if, if, we have some land that's actually available to use for that, you know, already. And so, mm -hmm. but, but I think we, we still need to have some data, I think from city court. And like I said, I'm looking at a 50,000 foot level. I mean, I'm, yeah. I just want them to do a, uh, an assessment on where, if we were going to do something like that, the where optimal position be? for it. Yeah. And, and, and you know, give us some reasons why. I mean, uh, you, you see what I'm saying? I, no, I'm I understand. Not, I'm not even, I, I just need to know more. And, and no. that's, that's where I'm at. I, I just don't want to go into a land acquisition talk and, you know, well, this piece of property is good. How do we know? You know, I want to hear it from, a, oh, from yeah. somebody from CityGate saying, no, you need a, if you're going to do this, this would be the property. You already have it or this is the reason why you'd want it here and yada, yada, yada. So that's- well, we almost not gonna be response times because that didn't seem to change much. Right. Well, <laughs> but there must be other factors involved. Yeah, right. Okay, so, so, so Jess, are you waving at me? That's Greg. Oh, Greg, are you wa waving at me? Okay. I don't have my glasses on now, so I, you know, you're just a blur. No, I, I think I, I understand the direction that, uh, that I'm, I'm getting here one, what I heard generally was we need a 50,000 foot level estimate of yep. what we need. That's a needs yep. assessment. Determine and where. Determine the, no, that's not where. Need is just what do you need? You need, I'm going to just pull a number out of the earth, 40,000 square foot building, and you yep. need three acres. You're going to situate the building on that, and you're going to have a secure parking area for both, you know, fleet vehicles, public parking, everything like that. That's your need. What I'm also hearing now is you want a site assessment or a siting study done. Mm -hmm. to say this would be the best site of those that are available in the inventory that meets this need requirement. And so right. I, I kind of see that as, as a hybrid of what they're presented. The needs assessment tells uh, identifies what Matt was talking about, this is what we need to have. And what inventory do we have out there that meets that need? But what I'm also hearing is, I want some discussion and commentary on what's the best site to drop this need on. Mm -hmm. Does that sum it up? Yeah, I think so. From what I, when I heard everybody say, yes. Um, Zach, you wanna add, you're the, you're the last one that hasn't given their second opinion <laughs> you know again it's like i think greg sort of summed it up i think that again the subcommittee needs to to see this again and in more depth i mean we we keep kind of going round and round on this i mean the idea of um of us sort of deciding um you know are we breaking away are we not or are we this are we that do we need what do we need what you know we need all this information right so you know greg sort of summed it up and it's like we there's a needs assessment and then Where's that land, right? Maybe it's uh, maybe it's in the heart of the city, and maybe it's not. Maybe annexation at some point, you know, solves that issue. I don't know. But again, we don't have the data, so um, I, this is something that I think we've got to look at just a lot, a lot harder. Okay, so Matt. Well, it is, and 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 so here's, but but it, it you know, Zach, you make a good point, and Greg, you kind of hit on it too. Is I mean, unfortunately, it still brings us back to the original question that you asked, Marianne, which is why, why right? So do we want to break the model that we have right now in favor of, you know, something else in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, if I'm not confident that the model is broken, then why am I, you know, investing, even if it's $20,000, it's still 25, you know, for me, that's a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, Especially so, right now. You know, how, you know, how is that, you know, justified if, you know, again, if I'm not confident that the model's broken and we need to move forward. 
right? And and look, I sadly, you know, I, I I agree with you in a lot of ways, Stu, and I don't want to foreclose on, you know, your ability to get the information that that you need. Um, but but if it's going to take us down a path that says, you know, why would we build a new station? Well, if if it doesn't get us response times or something, you know, operationally that's important. And if all all the end game is is a Temecula Police Department, that's a whole a whole other conversation. So how about how about if we try this? How about if we um, charge the subcommittee with working, um, you know, with the consultant and staff to give to come back with um, an I, you know, to come back with. Well, first of all, we got to have a, a cost because I, you know, cost is, is important. And so, you know, do you have do you have a threshold for cost, Matt, that you're willing to, you know? I don't want to throw out a dollar amount. I know, huh? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, well, I mean, like I, you know, in, anything that's, you know, got got more than, you know, uh, four zeros behind it is is too much. Okay. Um, so, yeah. but I think you can get, I think you can get your 50,000 foot view, um, Stu, uh, that way. So at least that'll give us uh, an inventory and a potential location. Now, once we get that, then maybe we come back. And to me, I think the next thing, the next discussion has to be is why are we doing it? And I, Stu, I know you know, you have your reasons for why, but why are we doing it? And because we're certainly getting great service now and you know, um, everything that we can point to demonstrates that 20th safest city in the country. So, um, you know, maybe I think that's, that'd be the time to, ha to have that next discussion, uh, because to, to me, it's we have to know why. What is it? What's it going to get us? Um, you you put it you put it very poignantly. Now, yeah. and that's and that's that's a that's a fear of mine, because I know what happens now, and sometimes it doesn't happen in the future, and if our crime statistics start changing, which maybe maybe not, I don't know. Um, but if it does, I just want to be well positioned. Oh, like I, like yeah, Jessica I said, it's an insurance policy. And, and I think, you know, like I said, again, we're in a window of opportunity in this city's history where 10 years from now, our, our budget is not going to be as fat as it is today. And so I want to, I want to put us in a position that we can make that decision if the now is not very good anymore that we can future uh, city council make that um it, it will not be a burden or a uh you know especially the land acquisition see i'm i'm literally okay with securing but again i need some data yeah. so securing the right location for if we went down that road and let's do that first and let's we don't, figure we don't, out yeah we don't we don't necessarily need to and like i said i mean these projects take forever to build so you know but there's always got to be a first step and there's always got to be that first um, uh, survey that goes out and there's got to be that first and i think we need to take that first step that's that's my that's my opinion i think we just got to we got to take that time to um, invest in the future, build that insurance policy, and and I agree. We're you know we're sitting pretty right now, and that's what scares me right now. So, well, we know we're budgeted out for five years, so we're sitting pretty right now for the exactly. Next years. Yeah. And, and that's that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing we've got a lot of opportunity to actually put us in a better position going forward. You know, even if we throw it in a CIP, I, we won't. Oh yeah, we yeah. Yeah, but but anyways, it, but we, I, I again, I just I still feel we need to get some sort of a fifty thousand foot look at this. Okay, so let let's do this and and let's try and craft a motion. So it's going to be for the committee and staff to work with the consultant um, to give us what we need in potential locations without specifically naming you know, a location because we don't want to start a, you know, um, you know, a, right. a land rush. So um, that and um, 
the location for, for Stu's sake and what parcels do we have now, right? Yeah. And working within the parcels we already have, the city yeah, parcels, absolutely. that would be a priority for me. Absolutely, me too. Okay, so is that a, let's is that enough motion for you to move forward, Greg? Am I having City Gate determine the need, the size of the facility and the footprint? If that, we can't, if we cannot figure that out ourselves based on general statistics, I don't know if that's something that's readily available. If I could, I, go I, ahead, Aaron. Um, I think I think what Greg's suggesting is probably the best course of action to consider tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm hearing, um, I yes, there's things that we can do on our own, and we're very resourceful in, in doing those things. Um, in this particular case. I think Greg and I would both agree we'd feel more comfortable having a law enforcement consultant third party mm -hmm. um, run and lead on on identifying needs, part one, and part two, um, site selection, and in concert with city staff. Yeah. And um, because uh, site selection is pretty complex as well. And, and it's not just identifying vacant land. It's, right. It might be uh, identifying developed land that uh, is multiple parcels that could potentially be acquired. I mean, that's what happened down here in Old Town. So mm -hmm. land acquisition is a, is a very complex sort of thing, but we, we don't even know how many acres we need to sort of fulfill that vision. So. Right. My recommendation would be, you know, Greg, tell me if you're good with this, but if if all five of you are, you know, generally good with what I just described, we can go back to, you know, the the police store station ad hoc, work with City Gate, craft a scope of work, and sort of make sure that we're we're solid, bring that back to the council and award a contract. So um that that would probably be the simplest way to make sure we got this right. Okay. So somebody want to can we can we include that as as a motion? Can I make that motion? Yes. Okay. Matt, are you good with that? Yeah. Can can I just just add the um, kicking it back to the other public safety subcommittee for conversation on operational improvements as well? Just just so I understand, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, that you want to take. Um, community policing slash kind of mental health training education mm -hmm. furthering uh, law enforcement conversations not to the police station ad hoc but the public safety ad hoc and begin those sort of conversations with sheriff with captain with yeah. myself and my office do i have that that's yep. like kind of a separate mm -hmm. action that you mm -hmm. want to 100 okay I think that, I got that definitely might change the need or the you know the size requirements and everything. So that's probably good. Well, too. I think his is not a his is not a facility thing. His is a more of a training, a training. Right. No. Thing. Right. Yeah. Right. But we may need space, you know, for specialized training or something that we, you know, don't know about right now. So okay. So which thing do we need to do first? Actually, Madam Mayor, um, I think we're good with the totality of that motion, and I have a first right. by um, Stu, and okay. just need a second and a vote. Second. Okay. okay, there we go. So we all have a general idea of what it is we've asked for, so we can have a roll call, please. Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Councilmember Ron? Aye. Councilmember Stewart? Aye. Councilmember Schwank? Yes. Mayor Edwards? Aye. Okay, um, now I'm down to city manager's report. Nothing more. Nothing more, please nothing more. Uh, Peter, anything? No. I have nothing tonight either. Okay, then I need a motion to adjourn to the meeting of May 25th. And I have a motion. So moved. And a second. And all in favor, aye. Aye. And adjourn, thank you.